first thing is to review and approve the agenda. We do not have very much on our agenda, um, but uh, would anyone like to make any suggested changes? Any suggested changes? Okay. Um, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, so on to general business and appearances. Uh, this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on an issue otherwise not on our agenda. And um, in this format, I assume uh, if you're here with, want to say something, maybe just raise your hand and I'll, I'll recognize you. Um, but to start out, uh, I want to check with uh, Bill and Cameron and John. Uh, do you have anyone on the line that would like to, uh, or in person, that would like to address the council? There's, there are no people here um, from the general public other than staff and David on the cameras. Um, Cameron is uh, staffing the phone line, and she says there's no one on the phone line. Okay. Uh, great. And looks like we have a few other folks joining us. Uh, welcome. And would any of you like to say anything? I can't see everybody. Can you see everybody? Uh, there should be a way up at the top uh, right where there's um, In gallery. You can't see them all at once. You have to cruise. You have to stroll. Okay. I'm trying. There is a way to do it. Check Mike Miller. gallery view and <clears throat> everyone will be tiled, kind of like on the Brady Bunch. Yeah. There's a picture up on the upper right that has like a down. square with Sorry. a bunch of little squares inside it. And if you click on that, you'll see everybody. Hopefully that helps. Bien, bien, thank you. <laughs> okay. The lady bunch. Well done, Jack. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Generational reference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so on to. Um, the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Can I before before you all do that? Can I just uh, do my due diligence here? This is John. I have a couple of small edits I can give John. Sure. Hang hang on one. Donna, hang on one second. John, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, because I don't have it to pass out the liquor licenses you all would be renewing, just for the record, as a uh, second class uh, license application uh, from Cumberland Farms. And a first class, as well as a outside consumption permit from Bear Naked Growler, and uh, they also have a second class as well. And uh, can you just clarify for us how this will work in terms of signatures? Normally, uh, we pass around a book. What is the procedure um, for this format? Well, for these, for the liquor license the only one I can speak to uh, liquor control from what I understand hasn't caught quite up to the situation so I'm just going to append a, a, a tested copy of the minutes and send them in so hopefully they'll be all right but uh, for the bills and John do you want to um, mention any of changes to the minutes oh I flipped around the ones you sent me uh, the participants from the 18th um, and it sounded like Donna wanted to get some technical changes to me that's that's fine if they're non uh, uh, substantive then you can just send them to me um, if uh, so Bill do we have the ability to unmute ourselves now I believe so yes I'm gonna try it just oh, more got muted okay and I've unmuted myself so um, I think at this point, uh, because we can unmute ourselves, if you would take a minute to uh, mute yourself, if you're not um, otherwise speaking, that would be great. Um, and uh, Donna, you have some amendments? Yeah. There in the, the 11th minute, it's the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, not committee. And transportation advisory committee. So just some words there that I'll send John. I'm sorry I didn't notice. And I had a question which I think John answered on the 18th. That not everybody was on the phone. Yeah, I had you all I flipped. I couldn't understand everything that John said. I had you all flipped as far as the participants. So they're flipped back. Who participated where? 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe we had a motion um, from Jack, was that right? And then Connor, did you second? Yep. Um, yep, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so, uh, this is, and you understand that to be as amended uh, by John and Donna, is that correct? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself if you're not already. But uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Okay. Okay. So the uh, pat, uh, the um, <coughs> consent agenda passes. And uh, so we're on to uh, the above and beyond uh, recognition for the month of February. Uh, uh, Bill, do you want to talk about this? Sure. We'll just go quickly. We uh, the, the recipient is not here, um, but uh, this month's recipient is Carrie McCool, who is one of our dispatchers, was nominated by several people um, for consistently coming to work with a good attitude and uh, able to juggle many things and has helped improve the work environment. Um, so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so we were happy that she was our recipient this year for the above and uh, this month for the above and beyond award. Great. Uh, well, congratulations to Carrie. Um, so grateful for her work. Um, all right. So uh, moving on to um, the uh, COVID nineteen response. Um, Bill, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Um, you know, I'm wondering if we want to, shouldn't do the downtown master plan first since the folks are all on the call. Sure. That seems fine to me. Any objections to that? And yeah. Okay, great. Uh, all right. So, uh, okay. So downtown master plan. Um, and I know, I see that we have, uh, at least someone on the line here. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about, uh, uh, the update. Hi, everybody. Mark Kane, SE Group. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. I'm sharing my screen, so hopefully you can start to see that. Uh, I'll just get to the beginning. I'm working on it. Uh, I am joined tonight by Patrick Olstead from SE Group. Can I just do that? And Anders Teresa from Watershed Yo. Consulting. Uh, so first off, let me say thank you. I know this is, uh, uh, we're all kind of learning some new technologies and trying to understand how the world works given the circumstances. So I appreciate you taking a few minutes to uh, uh, talk with us about this project tonight. Um, this is our second time to council, so I don't want to spend, uh, you know, going to rehash it all entirely, but I know there's some new council members. So we want to be, uh, recognize the fact that there's some new folks here who haven't seen this before or haven't had the opportunity at least to understand it in context with the, the work that was done. And I thought what I would do tonight is kind of highlight uh, for everybody's benefit some of the changes that were made from the earlier draft. Um, and let, me, let me preface this discussion by saying thank you for the comments. We, Anne was great to give us some great comments. Uh, we got a lot of other good feedback from staff. Um, and I think that was really useful in, um, in the changes that were made to get to where we are. So thank you for that, for very much. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to kind of give a highlight overview of some of the big things that the, the new version of the plan does. And Patrick, you can pick up and, and address any specific council questions if there are any. Uh, so the big thing I think that was really uh, we wanted to highlight in this final version was to clarify for everybody's benefit what the, what the preferred plan was. I think there was some uh, uh, confusion or perhaps un lack of clarity around what the preferred hybrid plan was. And uh, I'm going to skip down to that section, so bear with me for a second. And for those that have the document or have seen the document, it's on page um, I think I've got it right here. It's on page 30. So one of the things that uh, one of the things that was not as clear in the previous version was the sort of the recommendations on open space, infill, and bicycle pedestrian improvements. 
recommendations. We wanted to make sure that we added some materials to kind of communicate that. So there's a new plan in the document, a graphic in the document that sort of highlights um, some of those elements. Uh, Patrick, why don't you just walk everybody through kind of the big, the big takeaways for this, if you could. Sure. Uh, so, I mean, this is basically kind of hybridizing what we had as separate plans in the, in the first version of this report and keeping in um, all the stuff that we are ultimately recommending. I think the so the key things for this <clears throat> are that in terms of open space and uh, infill, we had a couple parcels where we showed them as being either open space or or infill, and, and we've kind of now gone ahead and, and made a specific recommendation. But in particular, this this parcel here um, next to where the bike path comes in, we're recommending that <clears throat> as as infill. There's a small alley space up here with that um, open uh, parcel that they're recommending as, as open space, probably in the form of more of like a plaza, given the scale of it. Um, that doesn't mean it wouldn't have some green in there as well, but um, a little, it's a little bit more of an urban sort of location. So I think those are kind of the key things that we honed in on in terms of uh, land use. And then in terms of the bike head component, we clarified that we're recommending <clears throat> the cycle track on Elm Street, which then would connect to a shared use path that would make its way down to the um, existing bike path. And so we are not recommending um, the uh, dedicated bike lanes on Main Street in, in our recommendations. So I think those are kind of the key things that, that this plan clarifies. Yeah, the other part of that I would just add with that there was some questions and some discussion earlier about the riparian zone, and I think this really clarifies that uh, one of the key objectives of uh, the plan was to identify that, um, from a land use perspective, that uh, the priority would be to establish that buffer, riparian buffer, really establish that riparian buffer, but also assure that it's connected to the urban fabric, so that it's not just sort of sitting by itself. It's got you know, good ability for the public to get down to that riparian area so that it can be both a recreational amenity, uh, also a stormwater amenity, you know, for all the street or stormwater treatment amenity, um, and a function as a buffer. So that was one of the core uh, things I think we wanted to clarify. And we had added, um, just for everybody's benefit, this graphic that kind of highlighted that in the sense that this is the, so the riparian zone, there may be some parking, but the idea is to create that buffer between it and then also to make sure that there's uh, there's a break or an opportunity to get from the streetscape environment to that riparian environment. So that was really kind of a core uh, uh, sort of a recommendation that we wanted to make sure came out in the in the final presentation. I think this is helping to do that. Um, the other one I think I wanted to sort of spend a couple minutes on was just uh, sorry, I was going to flip through here. Um, there was some conversation uh, earlier about, you know, the, the boldness of the plan, if you will. And I think, you know, as you can all hopefully appreciate the fact that this is a, a community planning process and there's always a blending of, of perspectives. And I think we had a really good steering committee and we had a really good set of engagements with the public. We heard a lot of different perspectives. But there was some concern or some thoughts around the fact that, well, is this, is this a bold enough vision for Montpelier? And, and I don't have to tell you guys, you guys think big. <laughs> you guys have always thought big. Uh, so that's great. Uh, but we wanted to sort of create this infographic to hopefully highlight the fact that there are some big things in here. And it may not seem it in terms of sort of the, the transition of the urban environment, but they are big in terms of how they position the city for the future. So. For example, it's six new public places within this study area, six new public spaces within this study area. Four of them are park environments and two of them are plaza environments. That's the Rialto Bridge Plaza and the, and the Town City Hall Plaza. That's a really big improvement over what's there today. That would be very transformational. Um, and as, as I hope you, as you can envision, imagine the, the, the Main Street or State Street with now a, a plaza environment integrated into it. That's from a visual experience, that's gonna be a very, different uh, and probably rewarding uh, outcome. The other piece I think that, that's really important is this graphic that shows the pedestrian zone expansion. So, you know, we're going on different street segments, we're going from 38 to 52% more pedestrian environment while still balancing the need to maintain cars. 
and that's something that, as we talked about in the plan at some length, um, you know, we heard from a lot of people in the business community that cars are still really important. The good news that I think is sort of relevant is that obviously we're making strides in expanding that pedestrian realm through this, this, these ideas, but also we're positioning for that number to go up even higher as the street evolves over time. So the idea of using, uh, setting forth the street design that allows you to flexibly get rid of some spaces as the demand wanes is really the kind of the core principle here. So it's very conceivable that if, you know, if these streets are constructed in sort of the approach that's been presented at 52% for Main Street, for example, within a few years, that could be 60, 70% as you have built out other parking facilities, as you create those connections to those parking facilities, and as hopefully as the demand for cars uh, lessens as we all get better at microtransit, better at using our bikes, and better at, at uh, walking to where we need to go. So that's a big, I think that's a big thing. And I think you guys are positioned really well to sort of make some strides there. Um, the other one, I know some people in the community are really excited about this, uh, 80 more new street trees that, that in this little study area. It's relatively small. This isn't the entirety of your downtown. This is a small portion of your downtown. So that's really huge. And I think it, 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 it comes also with a 15 <coughs> times increase in the soil volume to help them grow. So that's a huge uh, add, I think, in terms of the plan. We wanted to clarify that because the plan actually does document that, but it didn't really sort of speak to that. Uh, and then uh, the last one I sort of point out this is 15% average per street impermeable pavement. Um, Patrick, why don't you talk about that? That's a big number <laughs> in an urban environment. Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're uh, recommending the use of permeable pavers. Um, these would be like a traditional clay brick paver that has joint kind of spaces that allow water to pass through it. Um, so that's kind of in this designated tree belt zone uh, where this paver band would occur. And so that's going to be um, use, really useful for getting, you know, stormwater, rainwater to the roots of the trees so they can really thrive. It also is just reducing the amount of water that goes straight into the <clears throat> catch basin and can, uh, you know, potentially get some filtration action to improve water quality. So that's kind of a more progressive kind of way of doing things these days. Um, South Burlington installed, installed a street in Burlington did as well in the, in the past year. So, yeah, kind of the way things are headed. The other part of that that I think is really to go into this idea of how, how bold is this plan, how positioned is this plan ultimately to help the community sort of make those next decisions about what's the priorities, what's the design solutions, all of that. I think one of the things, and, and Andres, you can talk to this, is that we've made in this document and in this process a nexus between stormwater treatment and the development of the urban environment. And we've let, linked those together through that modeling process. And there was a lot of technical information that was provided in the appendix uh that some of you hopefully took a look at that's really pretty deep stuff and i'm not going to speak to it because we have so many other call that can actually speak to that but um but really come from our perspective from the planning perspective i think the most important thing is it linked it links i think in a real tangible way the idea that you can start to uh you can start to transition your streetscape to to achieve a stormwater treatment regimen and actually understand uh, what you're trying to do in terms of phosphorus reduction, for example. So that's a hugely empowering sort of frame of reference for thinking about urban design and, and streetscape design. It's not just to solve the, the human problem of, of pedestrian mobility or placemaking or economic development activity. It's also to achieve a, a tangible, demonstrable stormwater treatment outcome. And you know, Anders, you can speak this. Why don't you spend a couple of minutes yeah. talking about that? Because this really, I think, does propel you guys forward. Yeah, so I, can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the plan that we that we proposed was really, as Mark was saying, was really based on a quantified study. And it, I mean, it started by meeting with Public Works and really trying to understand kind of the constraints within the study area and also the um, really what the what the main water quality issues are within the study area so you know understanding that the soils are generally poor building foundations are are old you know there's concern about infiltrating the water 
um, because of the poor soils, because of potential, uh, you know, impacts to the buildings. And then also the fact that a lot of the, or I think all of the surface area within the study area um, drains to the river. It doesn't drain to the, to the combined sewer, uh, only the rooftops, only some select rooftops in the, in the study area drain to the combined sewer. So, you know, starting with that information, um, you know, what, what we proposed is really, I think, the best plan to, you know, filter the water, basically remove nutrients as much as possible, delay the discharge of the water to the river, um, and, you know, maximize the amount of, uh, the amount of benefit given the constraints and also understanding that, you know, really there's, there's, there is a limit to the amount of treatment that can be provided kind of within the streetscape environment. And that's why if you've looked at, you know, the other nine larger scale projects that we proposed, um, I think those are really a pretty important key to the whole, to the whole plan moving forward is, is to really get some really big water quality benefits. You know, the, those bigger projects, which are going to be collecting a lot more area are going to be really important. So I think the plan kind of balances maximizing the benefit within the streetscape within the public areas, and then also highlighting these kind of high priority, uh, larger projects, which are going to require more public private partnership, um, and more investment, more cost in the future, but are going to be valuable for, you know, reducing flooding and, and reducing nutrients to the river. Thank you. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to sort of highlight was the, you know, really a, another kind of kind of core point that we tried to make some clarification around, and that was the, the support of the purpose of this document, and and obviously the ask relative to the council at this point. And you know, this document, I think the plan that was sort of presented as the recommended plan, is still fairly malleable. I mean, it's going to change as the community gets more detailed into the design process and considers all of the other policies that the community has to consider in, its, in the city plan. Um, this, the purpose we saw this document serving was as a, as, a, as a frame of reference for as you go forward with some of those physical improvements that the streetscapes might go through. And obviously the Rialto Bridge is a project that's kind of in the forefront of where things are going. But also as you look at amending city policy, as you look at amending the city plan over time, as you sort of have those conversations about stormwater on a citywide basis, I think this plan provides you with a, with a, with a backstop to say, okay, how would that do, how would we address those issues in this core, but how could this core influence what might go on beyond it? I think that's kind of the way we saw this plan. It wasn't meant to be, uh, you know, the design set for the streetscape. It really wasn't. It wasn't meant to be the entirety of the stormwater strategy because this again only covered a small relative area of the city. But I think the things that it's introducing in terms of sort of policy framework and strategy framework are useful as a construct within the, the limits of the study era, but hopefully informative as the, as the council, as the city as moves forward and looks at how do you maximize the economic activity in your downtown? How do you, uh, you know, how do you address land use policy in the city. If if housing has to go in the core, what's the where are those infill opportunities for housing? But maybe the maybe the core's priority is less on the housing front and more on the uh, the open space front. Maybe that becomes the central uh, tenant. So we wanted to make sure we clarified some of that in this final version because I think there was a again another under, complete understanding of how this plan influences and serves the community, you know, going forward as it as it continues to uh, evolve. And I don't know if Mike or Kevin, if you want to add anything to that, because I think that was something we talked to you guys about quite a bit. And they're both on mute. Okay. <laughs> anything you guys want to add? It's not that fun. So, yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add. Um, I think that was that was a pretty good summary about where we're what we're trying to do. We really just want to make sure we get a lot of the big decisions take care of. You know, are we get street parking or have on street parking? And those type of questions that are answered at this step. Um, there's a lot of stuff that the, the details will change, but we really needed to kind of get these system decisions down. And I think SE groups 
um, and their team did an, did an excellent job of working with the, you know, the public participation to come up with something that um, met with uh, the public comment and, uh, and, and kind of achieves the goals that we had set out. Um, and now it's up to council to, to kind of decide whether this is the path we want to go forward on and then staff can start working on the pieces uh, and start building building this out. Um, you know, whether it's Berry Street, whether it's uh, State Street because of the Rialto Bridge, we would start working with staff to put that together. And I think um, that's what I, that's about all I would add. Great, so at this point I'm sure, or Kevin, do you have something you wanted to add? Or? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add that, you know, um, I went around and I talked to, uh, actually, Patrick presented to the MBA, and I went around and um, gave copies of plans to most of the businesses downtown, and there was pretty strong support for um, the concepts in here. Um, you know, I think people really did like the plaza concepts. Um, and I was surprised, because even the people that have, um, I talked to Sarah at um, uh, Bailey Road, and she was like, this is great. Like, I, you know, you would think that it's the parking space right in front of her place. And she was like, no, this would be awesome to have this in front of my store. So, you know, the, the, the initial concerns around parking, I think, are laid by the fact that it does require um, structured parking. Um, and, you know, that, 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 you know, it is that trade-off of saying like, okay, well, if, if you want that walkability, you know, there's the investment in, in structured parking. Um, but, you know, I, I would say that for the most part, everybody was very supportive. And, and most of the business community in downtown, um, most of the, they understood that this was conceptual and that there will be future opportunities as we get closer in design to, to you know, really get in there. But I, I, they liked the trees. Uh, there were only a few people who didn't like trees. Uh, but, um, no name. Uh, it's surprising where it came from, but um, <laughs> the um, for the most part, everybody really liked the idea of the you know the increased walkability, really focusing on the pedestrian um, as as the primary um, because of its small scale, and um, uh, you know I, I thought there was really pretty good support all around for this for these concepts. Great. So, uh, uh, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, I, obviously we're here. If there's questions, if uh, comments, obviously we're here to help under, you understand what's going on. So I'm sure there's a, a lot of comments or questions that uh, counselors have. Um, I can see you. I can see you all at this point. So if you have a question or comment, if you would just like raise your hand so that I know to it can fashion in, in order. Um, Okay, yeah, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, Kevin, when you were talking to businesses, do you think they were like supportive with the assumption that a parking garage would be built? Yeah. Um, or do you, do you think they would be okay with like actually reducing the net number of spaces there? Um, no. If we went through without having that like clarity? Uh, I would say that, you know, I mean, I, granted, I'm, I'm generalizing of those conversations, but I think that, you know, the plan is predicated on the parking structure. Um, and I think that when it comes to the business community, you know, there's a tremendous amount of frustration that the parking structure is not further along, obviously. Um, but they, I think that they could embrace this when they realize that, like, okay, there is, there is an alternative where we're looking at the streetscape differently, which looks great, um, you know, but, but if, if this was just an elimination of parking without a parking structure, I think it would be a hard sell. One thing that we heard too is that, or want to remind people, is the fact that the, the, the loss of parking, obviously this is not going to be implemented all at once in all likelihood. So there's going to be sort of a transitional piece. So if one segment of the street's sort of done at a time, State Street, for example, you know, no change on Main Street for a while. So. You know, it's going to be, uh, that's an important consideration, I think, in some of the conversations we have with people. It's not like it's all happening overnight, all of a sudden the parking changes and the garage is built. <laughs> so there's some, there's some recognition, I think, of that. Is anybody hearing this extra thing? A squirrel or something? Yes. <laughs> 
I hear a little sound, yeah. Sounds like old music. That seems like old music. Well, there's old music from the public line. Is that Mike picking it up? Probably. Um, Who's there last one? Mark, would you be willing to um, unshare your screen at this point? Okay. Okay. So, is anybody else hearing this? This uh, like a like a repeat of. There's somebody on the phone. There's somebody on the phone line. Somebody on the phone, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, it seems to have gone away. Okay. Um, great. So, um, other questions that um, people have, if you would just raise a hand, that'd be good. Other questions? Uh, Jack. Jack muted. Okay. Unmuted myself. Okay. I, I appreciate having this for the second time. I really got a chance to spend some more time with um, you. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry. Um, I got a chance to spend some more time with it, and I'm looking at the uh, comparison page, uh, page 33. Um, one of the things that we see is that uh, <clears throat> there's a difference in cost between option A and option B. And I recognize we're just kind of conceptual here. Do we have a sense of what that difference would be? Um, I'll, I'll answer that. Um, we we don't. <laughs> this is the quick answer. Um, but I think it's just generally, I think that we're pro proposing um, some kind of more um, more involved pavement treatments uh, with those plaza spaces. So if we're proposing pavers, whether they're concrete or even stone, especially across the street, then that's obviously just more of a more of an investment than if you're doing typical asphalt. So I think that's probably mainly where the cost is, is in those pavement treatments. You know, in Langdon, we're showing that as all pavers, you know, brick pavers or something. And, and so it, I think it's, that's mainly where the, the additional cost would be. Thanks. Uh, should I keep going? Sure. Okay. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I was trying to make sense of the uh, of the traffic flow with the uh, one way uh, southbound Elm Street and uh, and no uh, left turn from Elm Street onto State Street and I'm wondering if that's going to uh, cause uh, cause some traffic uh, distortions because if someone is on Elm Street north of downtown and they want to get to uh, one of the businesses on State Street, it might lead them to loop around Court Street to Governor Aiken just so they could turn left onto State Street and get into that block between uh, Elm and, uh, and Main on State Street for parking. Um, I actually, <laughs> we have, we have traffic engineers on our team, uh, with Stantec and they'd be best qualified to answer this question. I just, I just sent Greg Goyette a text in case, <laughs> Kate, I, and I said, that was the kind of the arrangement of if we needed them, I was going to let them know. So, um, I've texted him see, we'll see if he gets on. He says he is. So, um, I think once he's on, why don't you, if you could just go over that question, I apologize, ask you to ask. Sure. Go over it one more time, but he's going to be able to give you a, a better answer than I am. Let's see if he's on yet. I, I can tell you that Greg tested his connection the other day, so okay. it worked. Yeah, it should be good. There's no Greg. Mark, you're muted. Yep. 
there's other questions, we can we can kind of yeah. go beyond and come back to that one. Yeah, yeah. That might be it for me for right now. Thanks. So, Are there other questions? Yeah, other questions. Whew, I was getting some. I was getting some crazy feedback here, um, uh, but uh, so, everybody, um, everybody in city government's used to feedback, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, it seems a little better now, maybe. Um, all right, so, well, I, I want to thank you all for um, your, uh, your work with all this. Thanks for taking all of my feedback. Um, thanks for, uh, you know, addressing some of the specific concerns that that I had, and um, and for your thoughts on what to do with some of the spaces, like uh, next to the drawing board, as well as um, you know the riparian buffer. That was that was really helpful. Um, and uh, so I'm trying to late, scroll back up to the top here. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Late breaking uh, traffic engineer joined us, so we can address Jack's question. <laughs> All right, Greg, thanks for joining us. Uh, the question I raised was that uh, with the uh, one-way southbound uh, traffic on Elm Street and no left turn onto State Street, are we going to cause uh, distortions and problems with people who, who want to get to the block that they would be able to get to if they turned left from Elm Street to State Street by causing those people to loop around Court Street, then Governor Aiken, and then left onto uh, State Street, because that's also a tough place to turn left onto State Street from. Sure, yeah, understood. Yeah, it would definitely be a change in traffic pattern. Um, it's not uncommon for a downtown to have traffic patterns similar to that. Um, so that is a trade-off um, in terms of uh, the traffic pattern, but um, what would happen is with the one way we're prioritizing um, uh, both pedestrian and bicycle movements at on that road and also that intersection as well because it's a tough intersection to cross from a pedestrian perspective so um, yeah I mean it would there would be some trade-offs and there would have to be a little more traffic analysis done to understand the implications of that um, in terms of what those impacts would be um, to the circulation patterns in the the intersections if that were to be implemented. Craig, what, Craig wouldn't it also be true though that the uh, the changes on State Street that we're talking about, um, I'm sorry, Main Street that we're talking about, might actually improve that the usefulness of that for traffic flow? In terms of um, what changes, Mark? In terms of like instead of people taking Elm to come down and actually taking Main to come down. Because obviously though there's a there's a traffic circle up above the street's got a little more I mean I think there's there's, there's some benefits now of the streetscape design actually making that a better you know movement without the bicycle lane there. Right, right. Yep. There there would be some some uh, better movement there without the bicycle lane. Yep. Right. Except I may be wrong, but uh, there are still going to be parking spaces on the south side of State Street between Elm and. Uh, Main, is that right? That's right. So then you could not get to those spaces from El from Main Street. Just as a side though, do you think, Greg, that um, with the southbound Elm Street and a right turn only, you because of the proximity to where the future parking garage would be, it would effectively that southbound Elm Street Lane or Lane would take you, would feed you towards the parking structure. So if you were going downtown, it would be actually just more convenient to just pull into the parking structure because it's turn right on the on the state and a quick left into the parking structure, and you're you're in downtown and you're you know a block away from from the core. 
Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, coming down Elm Street, you would have straight access into the parking structure. And it's true, if you're coming down Elm Street, you wouldn't be able to take that left and use those parking spaces on the south side. But they could still be utilized by folks coming um, down State Street, uh, heading uh, west to east toward Main Street. And I totally agree that that left turn from Elm Street to State Street is terrible much of the time. Bad enough as it is now, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the Mark, other thing. Mark, the other, Mark, I wonder if you should um, share your screen and pull up that the plan, like the parking plan, maybe. It might just be helpful to take a look at that while we're talking about it. Sure. Sure. We have the technology. That's right. Let's do it. Wait, you passed it. Oh, I did. Sorry. Or, uh, or is it? Right. Oh, it's right there. Uh, there yep. uh, let me just do the right view here. So that sort of helps. I think that makes the argument there relative to the access to the parking garage and the idea that, okay, with with the, with the treatment there and sort of an entry point into the garage established, it sort of actually it actually may encourage the garage to be used <laughs> because it's gonna it's gonna funnel people right to it. So that's actually yeah. pretty handy. Yeah. yeah. Do you think we're gonna need a signal there because of the? Uh... People, if people want to go right across the street to the parking garage, you think, Greg? It's 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 possible there may need to be one there, um, depending on how the circulation changes and who ends up using Elm Street. But um, you know, my sense is you're going to be removing left turns at that intersection too, so um, you may you may in fact have a little less traffic, uh, you know. You won't have any traffic turning left on Elm Street, and everybody coming down Elm Street would just have to turn right. So, my overall sense is one wouldn't be necessary, but that would need to be studied further. Thanks. Yeah. Great. Uh, any other questions? Well, I do have a question about the maintenance costs of the uh, of the pavers, uh, maintenance and durability. And is there uh, is there real life experience that supports that it's not uh, any worse than pavement? Um, I mean, I would say that clay brick pavers are going to be uh, a lot more lot more durable than c concrete paving, actually, because uh, concrete paving is susceptible to falling from salt and the clay pavers are not going to. So um, I would recommend looking at uh, downtown Winooski if you wanna see how a clay brick paver can perform. Um, it's held up incredibly well. Um, I think the permeable pavers are a little bit newer, so that's maybe something that's a little bit less tested, but the brick pavers themselves are gonna have the same durability. I think there's just some added maintenance involved with, with them. Uh, you know, to, to keep the, the joints from getting clogged up with debris over time. Um, so that's something that I guess should just be considered, um, you know, before committing to it to make sure that kind of periodic maintenance can occur. Otherwise, the permeability will just be reduced. I, I think it would take a while before it went to zero, but it would, you know, it would go down in permeability over time if it wasn't maintained. And, and okay, Patrick, thanks. Patrick, just to add one quick point on that, Jack, is yeah. that, is that by using a unit paver, if you do have to do maintenance repair, mm -hmm. you, the, the field that you're replacing can be smaller. So in terms of a, uh, you know, the cost differential, the long-term cost differential, if you only have to tear out five square feet of space to get to an underground utility because you're just picking up pavers, that's a lot cheaper than having to dig up 10 or 20 square feet because of its other asphalt or something like that. So there is some benefits of a unit paver that are sort of not necessarily by the material itself, it's just the fact that you're using a unit paver. Right. One point. question uh, about that. Uh, let's say somebody does tear up, um, you know, the street for that. I assume you have to destroy the pavers. No. Nope. Um, or you, no. but you can reuse the same one. Yep. Yep. Um, that's that's actually that's the big the benefit thing. of them. That is a big that is a big benefit in terms of being able to pick them up effectively, get them out of the way, put them back. Church Street Marketplace is it's 
it's it's been decades of of picking up papers and moving them around, and they occasionally have to replace them. Uh, but it's it's a very efficient uh, treatment in terms of being able to access the underground material yeah, utilities. But. Yeah, and aesthetically, it, it's better too after it's patched because you can you can't tell that anything was done, unlike you when you saw cut through pavement or concrete. Yeah, exactly. Sounds great. Uh, yes, Dan. Let me see if I can. Uh, so the question I have actually on the pavers, though, isn't what kind of maintenance, um, you know, as far as frost heaves or um, not just simply scraping on them, but just the, how they settle over time. Um, is there any impact that has a greater cost to, to those type of um, well, it's actually interesting because uh, uh, one of my coworkers sent a, a link out recently talking about how the sinking on uh, the base material used under unit pavers is changing. And I think what they're going towards more is an open graded stone as opposed to something packed really tight with fines, which is kind of more traditionally what's been happening. Because that type of treatment is more susceptible to that freeze call um, uh, action. Not just simply scraping on them, but just the, how they settle over time. <laughs> Their cost to, to those uh, uh, It's actually interesting because uh, uh, one of my coworkers said that. Uh, I'm going to let this ride out. So yeah. I'm so, going to, I think the same thing was happening to uh, both Dan and I earlier, if you have the agenda open um, and it's playing back um, what we just said, that's probably what that was. <laughs> so, yeah. I'll, Sorry, I'll, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, Dan. I'll carry on. Yeah, so go anyways, ahead. Yeah. Anyways, with the, with the permeable paving, it is a very open graded stone that lets the water pass through. And so you have much less susceptibility to that freeze thaw, thaw um, action. So I would not be worried about it. So I don't think that's going to be a maintenance concern at all. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can add to that a little bit too. Um, you know, when when pavers settle, uh, it, it tends to be a flexible, you know, settlement. So they kind of settle together uh, versus a concrete sidewalk. When you have five foot by five foot wide panels, or sometimes larger, you'll see one panel settle more than the other, and then you get a lot of uh, you know, lipping that occurs between panels and those have to be ground down or pavement has to be put in to smooth those over. So um, I don't see any more maintenance from a paver perspective over a concrete sidewalk and maybe even a little less. Yeah, because- oh, Go ahead. I was gonna say like to Greg's point, yeah, you see concrete pavement where an expansion joint with one of those panels heaves up, you know, and you've got an exposed edge, then they're going to get caught on the plow. And I think with brick pavers, you know, it, it's it's a little more, it is more flexible. So you're less likely to have that situation where it's popping up, popping up enough to really catch a plow and chip the way concrete can. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not so concerned about chipping. I mean, I, I grew up in the Midwest and the city I grew up in had a lot of brick paver streets. Yes. And the thing that I always noticed for years and years was that, um, you know, they wouldn't necessarily be chipped away, or even if they were chipped, it was minor, but they would settle over time yeah. and you'd have these big dips, either, uh, like Greg was saying, across the row uh, of pavers, but it would be a substantial dip where you'd have to almost stop before you got to it, or else they'd have these, these settling, almost like a little brick pothole kind of thing where it was a, a dip below and my concern at least on main street with this is that you know has there been any tests with this kind of heavy traffic uh as well as sort of the frost the freeze thaw cycle that we go through up here greg, greg i'd be curious to see what you say but my guess is that the, the dipping is a result of like inadequate compaction or inadequate base material something of that realm um, in the installation but Greg, maybe you could chime in and see, see what you have to say. Yeah, I agree. It, it, if if uh, pavers settle like that, it's usually due to a uh, poorly designed sub base, maybe not enough underneath for the structural support yeah. or um, just, you know, poor installation. Um, you know, we've seen
seen in Burlington installations that hold up really well. The installations in Winooski have certainly held up over the test of time. Um, and uh, those those have a nice base underneath them. They were compacted and you know, it comes down to uh, the quality of the design and then the quality of the construction. St. Albans is also holding up really well over six, seven years now. And is this with heavy traffic and all these in both Winooski and uh, St. Albans? Yeah, yep. It's full on Route 7 traffic on the crossings. Yeah. I mean, Winooski, Winooski I think the, the uh, brick pavers are in the pedestrian zone. I don't think there are any in the vehicular zone there, but Church Street certainly, and you know, that gets really <laughs> heavy trucks on it. I mean, there has been some some breaking of bricks on, on Church Street, but you know, that, yeah, that, that gets way more you did have to stop SD Ireland from driving their cement trucks up there for yeah. St. Patrick's yeah. Day. That was a big problem. Right. <laughs> right. right. Uh, and then I had one other question about State Street and the parking. Is, is was I correct in, in seeing that the par, uh, the um, angled parking that's right now in front of the post office is going to go away and it'll all be parallel parking along State Street? That's that's what we are recommending. Yeah, I think um, I think part of that was to get maybe a little more sidewalk space and also from a bike safety standpoint, if anyone's using State Street, um, you know, it's just not preferred having cars backing, backing out of angle spaces. But I, yeah. Uh, Jay, I know you had a comment or a question. Yeah, hey, uh, not not paper related, um, Marco. And way way back to the beginning, I'm curious to get a little more uh, uh, detail and your thoughts on the infill um, off of uh, Main Street, right off the new bike path, um, where you recommended infill. I just want to understand the balance between uh, buffer with the river and the confluence with the, the North Branch and the Winooski there. Yeah, I'll start, Patrick, you can just jump in there too. Um, I think the idea for that, <clears throat> excuse me, that infill was, you know, it's an environment, obviously Shaw is, is an example, that's probably the, the spot you're talking about. And, you know, at some point that may redevelop. So, oops, that, we do, that may redevelop at some point. We don't know what that's going to be from it. Am I muted? No, you're good. Okay, uh, I had this message come up. Um, we don't know what that's going to be, but I think the idea is that whatever infill happens there, I think the, 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 the policy framework that we're sort of looking at it through is to, is to one, make sure it maintains the riparian buffer, so make sure there is an adequate buffer on the back side of it, the, the river side of it. Two, make sure it engages the streetscape in some meaningful way so that whatever is put there is not just kind of like, you know, parking in the rear, you know, can we do that and do it right? And also that there's an opportunity for people to get through that space to get to the river. That's kind of the, that's kind of the, the, the basic uh, policy framework we're looking at for that, for all infill, it's, it's especially infill that's related to the streetscape edge is that it's gotta be uh, permeable enough, porous enough to let people get to the river. So uh, much like the current bike path is sort of achieving that, if something redevelops on the Shaw's lot, for example, the hope we would have is that it would still allow people to get down to the river some meaningful way, that it would not just sort of be a, a wall that prevents the access to that. I don't know if you wanted to jump on that, Patrick. I think, yeah, just we're, we're really trying to reestablish the more historic development pattern of having those buildings right up at the sidewalk. Um, you know, multi-story, probably three-story building kind of following that pattern of what's there versus the, the one-story building set back with a parking lot in front of it. You know, obviously it's, not a great gateway to the downtown so we want to try to make it more in character with, with the other part of the downtown super thanks guys that's really helpful great other questions uh jack jack, so okay. jack. sorry about that <clears throat> Yeah, I was trying to click the little microphone on the picture of me, not down at the bottom. I did that too. <laughs> this is new to me. 
Okay, Greg, I'm glad you're still with us. Uh, this is something that I've thought about for a while, and I just noticed a comment in uh, Front Porch Forum raising the same question, and it's not to do with anything we've talked about or anything that's in the report, but it has to do with uh, addressing the the two alleys that are, or driveways that go off uh, Main Street into the behind building parking, the one next to Obishan and the one next to uh, the vacant lot, and whether it would be feasible and uh, desirable to set it up so they're both one way. One is one way going in, one is one way going out, so that uh, <clears throat> it would potentially reduce uh, pedestrian conflicts, especially if uh, cars aren't coming out of that very narrow alley next to Obishan, um, and what that would do to the traffic flow on uh, Main Street. I'm, I'm, I'm going to chime in real quick. Um, yeah. um, in, our, in our plan, we actually did address those, and we recommended that they become closed to vehicular traffic completely oh. and uh, being just pedestrian only. And, and that was an idea that we kind of came to in talking to Stantec. So, Greg, you might want to just chime in and explain that idea of how, how the parking would be accessed and how that can function. Yeah, sure. We would try to focus um, the access to the parking areas in some in some of where the main driveways are located and closing off some of the, um, you know, smaller driveway accesses where if you're walking on the sidewalk, uh, a car pops out, it's a pretty dangerous situation. And likewise, for a vehicle popping out of those driveways, there's no sight distance around the corners of those buildings. So um, by focusing or condensing some of the uh, driveway locations to, to fewer spots, um, that actually may improve traffic mobility on Main Street because you have less traffic popping out in rogue places where they're trying to take a left out of that driveway and cars are stopping and letting them, letting them take that left. And if they're focused in a few spots versus several spots, um, our, our, our thought is that is going to improve mobility along Main Street and improve safety for pedestrians and, and vehicles. Well, I'm sorry I didn't focus on that. Uh, how, would the, how would people get to that parking in the back of those buildings uh, under this uh, system? Yeah, so... Um, so we would still have a few driveway accesses. So Abishan, um, where uh, um, where the uh, um, new rec path is coming in toward Berry Street, right? Yep. There's a left-hand turn into that, um, that that new driveway that was constructed. So there's access back there to get in and out. That's a two-way access. Okay. And that would be the exclusive access to the, the parking back there, probably. That would be if we close the other alleys down, yes. Okay, thanks. Well, Greg, would the other alleys be, at least one of them be probably open for, I mean, I would think emergency vehicles could get in there if they needed to. Yeah, yeah, that, that could happen, of course. Yeah. Great. Any further questions about or, or comments about the plan? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I, sorry to keep uh, going through this. I. One thing that's it's really more of a question than uh, more than a or more of a comment than a question in the streetscape comparison page 33 it uh, <clears throat> you note that option B maintains more convenient on street parking on state street which another way of putting it is that option A provides less convenient on street parking on state street and for people who want to reduce parking and vehicles on State Street and uh, have more bikes and pedestrians, that actually would seem to be a plus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I guess what we, I, I think what we thought ultimately in our recommended plan was the kind of the hybrid option, mm -hmm. which uh, maintain more parking on State Street. And, and you're right, Jack, for some people that maybe isn't a positive you know, from some of the input we got from some of the business owners, they did want to maintain the parking there. So I think that was the case of trying to find the balance. And we thought that with the hybrid plan, we're still enhancing or expanding the pedestrian zone 
significantly enough that it was, you know, a, a, a still quite an improvement over what's there. So, and we did maintain that kind of more enhanced plaza space of option A. So that was the case of trying to find a little bit of a balance between those competing interests, I guess. And, and as I sort of started this conversation, I think there's an opportunity to evolve that over time. So as, a, as the parking demands change, you can start to reclaim some of those spaces right. and turn them into more pedestrian environments. So I think the screen shapes could, could adapt uh, to the need. And, and in the short term, you still have the ability to have those parklet spaces out there to provide outdoor dining. And so that's all another kind of flexible approach to that. Great, thanks. Sure. Okay, so uh, uh, this agenda item didn't, uh, at least uh, in the cover sheet that we got, it didn't make a mention of uh, recommending, like the, the suggested act was not necessary to approve this plan, but um, I suspect that that um, might be use useful. Um, so I'm curious from either any of the staff, uh, would some kind of a motion to accept this plan uh, be useful to you? Um, and then we can see if there's a motion. Yeah, I think a motion would be helpful um, because they're going to have to work to make final edits so they can get a final product. Um, and again, as Mark po has pointed out, uh, this will be a, a, a flexible document once it's completed, but they, they do need to have um, some final guidance so they can move forward to get a final plan um, per the grant agreement. We've got to be wrapping this up. So, um, yes. Okay. And certainly that could be uh you know jack it's your your thoughts there you, you know you want to talk more about that or amend it that the the plan as recommended you know that's something but donna you had something you want to say well again the plan is just a based reference and so i i feel it's you know where we need to be to this add on in the future as things change great so i would like to see us pass it as it is do you want to make a motion? Okay, I thought maybe you. Okay, um, it doesn't matter. You we, Jack wanted to incorporate changes anyway. Well, well, yes, I'll make a motion that we adopt the Montpelier Downtown Core Master Plan. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, any further thoughts? Um, I, I think it's important to note. To um, just speaking to Jack's point about the parking uh, east of the Rialto Bridge, um, that, that that's something that we could also revisit later. But I think this, all, I agree, you know, this takes us uh, in that direction, and I think it's um, there's a lot of really uh, wonderful steps in this plan. So, um, any other? Oh, Dan, yeah, go ahead. Well, I just uh, just on, along those points, this is something where is our understanding that where if we approve this, that there would be an opportunity to revisit or to tweak some of those more minor points as they as we come along. I'm going to assume so, but uh, you know, staff, either Mike or Bill, would uh, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah, I can just jump in to to say that this. So this is the conceptual plan. We. Before this can ever move to getting built, we're going to be having to go through um, design and final design. And there are multiple steps that we'll be going in where we'll have to have, um, you know, we'll have to have Stantec or somebody do the traffic analysis on those intersections so we can get final, final designs and final turning radiuses um, and everything approved. So there's going to be multiple opportunities to make um, some of these smaller edits that are going to need to be made along the way. Um, this was really to get more of the bigger concepts down and approved so we know what direction we can get DPW working on and the planning department working on. Okay. Um, Donna, did with you those have... Sorry, go, uh, oh. go ahead. Sorry, um, Mike, are those, those opportunities to come back before us or those before the development review board? opportunities just to be clear uh, these these would come back to city council at some point because you know, uh, we're going to be whether we're applying for grants um, or just approving 
approving in concept. Uh, I think of this in the same way that we did uh, the transit center. It was approved as a conceptual plan in 2000, and then we built on that conceptual plan that said, this is where we want to have a transit center. Um, and then from there, we built on that to go through and say, okay, well, what's it going to look like? What are the final details? What's the accessory okay. secondary use going to be? Um, and these will continue to come back to, to council. You guys ultimately make the decisions on these. Okay, that, that answers my question. Thanks. Um, Donna, anything further? No, no, Mike covered it. Okay. Okay, any further questions? Okay, uh, so there's a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Great. Well, thank, thank you again you. for all of your work on the. Uh, I think really it's going to take us in, uh, in a really good direction. And, so, thank you, and thank you guys for all the hard work you're doing for your community. I've talked to a lot of people around the state, and I know it's it's a tough time, but I'm sure your citizens appreciate it. Thank so thank you. So you. Thank you. Okay. Have, have a good all night. All right. Have a good Great. night. Yeah, so that's night. a thank you. Night, everyone. pretty exciting um, step there. So uh, looking back to the agenda, so um, coming back to um, the city's uh, COVID-19 uh, response. Um, and at this point, I will turn it back over to Bill. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we had sort of three areas <clears throat> we'd like to go over with you tonight. One um, is just outline some of the activities that have gone on. I, I sent that out to you. One is to include um, Montpelier Development Corporation and Montpelier Alive in this conversation at your request. And Bill Kaplan just dropped in and joined us. Welcome, Bill. And Hello. and then uh, Kelly will uh, provide a brief update on where we are with finances. And I think uh, she'd sent that out as well, um, all of which are, are challenges. So um, I'll just launch into this. We'll try not to go too long. I think the biggest thing for us today uh, was addressing the governor's uh, last executive order from last night and trying to make sure how that, how that jives what we're doing. I think the biggest decision we're trying to decide and is whether to actually physically close City Hall on, Mon uh, on Monday or Tuesday, we decided to close the offices but still leave the building open so that people could come in and get warm and use the bathrooms and those kind of things. Um, Barry City has confirmed with me that they've actually physically closed their uh, offices since the 18th. So we're, we're trying to wrestle with that and how that fits. We've also gone through, we're in the process of going through every employee here in this building and, and through our, our, our organization to figure out who fits which category and which ones can work from home and which ones can't and should and those kinds of things. So those are all uh, have been our top priority. Um, we uh, are dealing with any referrals and communication with, with people. They've been, uh, the Zoom technology has been great for a lot of our, our meetings. Uh, as per the decision last week, uh, the digital parking meters and kiosks were put into sleep mode. We've held uh, at least one or two Facebook Live uh, discussions uh, with the mayor. We hope to do more of those. I think those have been well uh, received. And the most recent one, we also got a sign language interpreter to do the to interpret the video after the fact. We weren't able to have it done live. Um, we met with uh, staff and the mayor met with the Montpelier Mutual Aid Group. Uh, I think the most exciting thing that's coming forward is there's a Thrive, a group called the Thrive Regional Response Command Center, uh, which is teaming up with the state uh, and the Washington County Homeless Task Force that was had been formed to basically deal with the human services gaps and the vulnerable population. This is being headed up by Sue Minter, Eileen Peltier, and uh, Joan Marie Misek, uh, and um, they're in full uh, incident command mode. Uh, I had a meeting, uh, a phone meeting with them on Sunday, and essentially some of the concerns that I've been expressing with the city not really having the capacity to deal with 
some of this is really being taken off our shoulders by this group. Uh, our Ken Russell from our and, and our homeless task force has been uh, linked in with them. Not to say there aren't going to be problems, but uh, they've already got up and running, uh, in, in, along with the state, uh, renting out a couple of hotels for people. So homeless people are now not in congregate shelters, but rather in individual rooms with their own bathrooms. Uh, I think that's probably a safer, more comfortable situation anyway. So it's a, probably a good outcome in the big picture. Obviously, we're still working through the details. We've been meeting uh, with officials with Barry City, Barry Town, uh, to make sure that we're all backing each other up on critical, uh, critical services like water treatment, sewer treatment, those kinds of things, and that uh, everything. We've uh, had information from Green Mountain Ch uh, Transit about their daily bus disinfecting protocols. Uh, the Sustainable Montpelier Co Coalition and the mayor have connected to uh, launch the CAN initiative. Uh, and the schools ha and uh, have reached out to us. We've had discussions with the schools as well as their partners in education, offering assistance. Uh, again, I think that group will really best link up with this vulnerable population task force uh, and uh, who are looking for volunteers. Talked a little bit over sheltering. Um, the, we, the senior center has a van, uh, which we are letting the homelessness emergency response team use for transportation. Uh, so that's great. That's helping getting people to where they need to be. Um, another way has closed for in-person services. As I mentioned, we have um, re re uh, homeless people uh, now residing in hotels. Internal communications, uh, Kelly's going to talk more about this, but we clearly will have a budget gap as a result of this loss of revenue. And so we are looking at all options for that. I know uh, at your last meeting, you were hoping that we could identify significant cuts to reinvest into the community. Um, we're thinking we may need to make significant cuts just to keep the city rolling for the rest of the, uh, till the end of the fiscal year. Um, we've, we've issued new guidance on uh, sick leave and how to, how to use working from home. Um, based on the, the CDC's guidelines and also this new federal act. And as you've been copied on, we've been trying to communicate regularly with city employees to know so they get a sense of what's happening and uh, also communicate out to the residents uh, different steps that we're taking. I probably will do this again to communicate it to the residents tomorrow after we conclude tonight. So those have been the, the basic things that we've been working on, uh, trying to keep ourselves rolling along, uh, serving residents, but also providing the proper protections and things. So I'm happy to answer any questions about any of those. Uh, Connor. Yeah, Bill, just in light of the sheltering in place executive order from the governor, um, what role does the uh, Montpelier Police Department play in that? Like, are they authorized to sort of give misdemeanors for people out? Uh, I'm just kind of wondering how that plays out day to day. Uh, the chief is here and can answer that, but I, I might save him a trip up. There, there was a guidance sent out by the Department of Public Safety today, uh, and I believe you may be copied on it, although it's probably in one of the many things you've received. Um, but it it's basically urging voluntary compliance, urging people to to – you know, clarifying what is and isn't uh, okay to do. It's certainly okay for people to be out for a walk as long as they're keeping safe distance. I think the question is if uh, people are really intentionally violating and there was a whole series of, of things. I don't, I don't think they're going to become the congregation police, but uh, certainly we would uh, be looking to keep urge people to, to do the right thing. But there's a very good uh, guidance written by uh, Colonel Birmingham from the state police to all police departments that, you, that I think you've been copied on. Anything else you want to add, Chief? No. no. Okay. Excuse me? Oh, so the chief is saying he'd like to thank the, the public at large for complying, that it's been very cooperative. Uh, Donna. I had a, a question about a term Bill used in his manager's report about the planning department being quarantined. It seemed different than the other lock the doors, not don't letting anybody in. 
So it made me concerned. Yeah, there, there's well, there was a, a potential exposure, which proved not to be the case with a family member of one of the, the planning department staff. So they we did take a little bit extra precaution there uh, and closed that office to the public. That that family member has since had a negative test. Uh, so that was the reason for that term versus everything else. But they are still, given the governor's order, they are still primarily working remotely. Yeah, I was just concerned. and But it made me think, if indeed one of our employees became ill, would we be able to know to give them support, or is that confidential? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Um, and I think the... Um, the term, unfortunately, that we probably need to be using is when one of our employees becomes sick, because it's almost certain yep. that yep. many of us will. Uh, and, and it's a question of how many and, and what impact it has. Um, you know, there are HIPAA re requirements, but we also have, uh, you know, the, the impact of others that might be involved. What, hence the reason for people trying to be away from one another and not having the public coming into our offices. So I kind of evaded your question because I don't really know how you know if I can tell you, you know, Bill Fraser's so, sick today. I got it. I send got him. It, yeah. 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 Thank you. Any other comments, uh, Lauren? Um, a few thoughts and apologies that the Lorax is loudly playing in my background and I can't figure out my headphones. So hopefully the audio audio quality is okay. Um, so. One thought I had was just, I talked to um, to Bill about this a little bit, but just really encouraging like as much proactive communication as possible. I know I've been seeing stuff on front porch forum and stuff, but I think even more just reminding people of all the resources on our website and when we can connect people to this new Thrive group. Um, you know, today, for example, there was a post about how we're closing the city um, offices. It didn't, you know, that could have also included and remember to look for more resources on our website for how, you know, if you want to volunteer or if you are in need of things where you can find resources of, to get you what you need. Just, just encouraging as much as we can to be out there every single day with here are, here's the resources, you know, there's so much good work happening and making sure people know about it and that the city's kind of on top of it. I would just love to see that and even stuff like you know it was great to see like lost nation theater had a fun thing they put out if we could put out fun stuff to everyone you know sheltering at home and how are we just kind of keeping our community connected and together so just encouraging that as much as possible like i loved the facebook thing that um the mayor and city manager did and just more of that i'm just <laughs> just encourage that um so we can keep people updated um I, hopefully you're enjoying the Lorax in the background of all of these. Um, An all-time classic. One, <laughs> one, uh, one question I had was, um, yeah, it, I guess it'll be coming up in the coming weeks, but like, what plan do we have um, for the city in terms of looking into, so, you know, any time now, presumably this big stimulus package from the federal government is going to be passing, which has a chunk of money for cities and states and then state stimulus and efforts and just, you know, who and how can the council help with looking at what kind of opportunities there will be to get that kind of money um, into our city. So we're helping our residents and our local businesses. So just curious if the um, city manager or, or anyone else has thoughts on kind of how we can track and access and make sure that we're, you know, doing all we can to bring resources to our community. So we're obviously following the bills closely, as are the League of Cities and Towns, providing us information about how to do those. And we'll be um, taking, we're already, as we've thought about people's leave, we're trying to structure it. There are some that's reimbursable through these acts and some that's not. So trying to think about how to get people in the reimbursable kind. Um, so definitely top of our top of our mind. And we may, of course, be coming to the council to approve grant applications or those kinds of things. Um, just two other quick things. Um, one, it, it could be helpful to to talk through a little bit. We we touched on it during last council meeting, 
And I know that the city staff have been doing a lot of thinking about like what's the redundancy in our systems and who can make decisions knowing that, you know, today the announcement that we're, we are on the exponential curve of um, this, this pandemic um, affecting Vermont communities. So just the plan for how decision-making can happen and just more clarity because I know um, staff has put a lot of work in that. Yeah, so we've developed a, a, a sort of authority matrix for every department or are finalizing that. Or we've gone four deep with each department uh, and, um, you know, understanding that we could have multiple people sick at once. And uh, hopefully that will be sufficient. We will go deeper if, if it looks like that's wise. Uh, we have a general continuity of operations plan, which is being... Um, rapidly updated and also sort of um, particularized to this type of, you know, I think most of our continuity of operations plan assume that, you know, we got flooded out or, uh, you know, so knocked out of operations somehow, not necessarily a long-term pandemic yeah. like this. One big bubble. What's that? Excuse me? I couldn't hear what you were saying. Just all bubbly. Maybe it was only my reception, but... Was Most that, of what you said the last two minutes, I couldn't get. Everybody else? Was that the same? Everybody else is fine. Then okay. I, I could hear you okay. Okay. Um, so anyway, we are working on co continuity of operations plans. And um, yeah, it's absolutely a necessity. Um, so we're doing that. Uh, you know, you and I took briefly uh, under Vermont law. Right now, at least, uh, the council can't take any action without a majority of the council present, a quorum. And in fact, even then, it has to be the majority voting similarly. So if only four of you are present, all four have to vote yes for something to pass. That hasn't changed. Um, so we uh, haven't, I haven't done more thinking since we talked yesterday, Lauren, but we might want to think about and maybe talk with our attorneys. Is there a way that the council can take um, preliminary action to authorize the manager or someone to act on their behalf if if the necessity should uh, enact. And I don't even know if that's possible, but I think it's something we might want to look at preventively. I know some other communities are doing things like increasing spending limits uh, for the staff or the manager so that things don't you know don't get held up by having to go to a council that can't meet. So um, we haven't. You know, we don't think we're there yet, but those are all possibilities. Thank, thank you for um, sharing all that and all the work going into um, being prepared. I guess just one last thing I was thinking about, and I don't know, is that John Odom there? Um, just with this change to your opening up that elections could be done differently, just would love and offer myself to, to work with the city clerk and whoever else, but just thinking about how we can start preparing right away for how our primary election in August might look um, and that we're you know, being as accessible and getting, um, getting ballots to everyone who needs it in whatever format, if it's mail, if it's whatever contingency plans we can come up with. Um, so just want, hope the city's thinking about that as well um, and happy to help with that however I can. I'll just, if you're curious, um, we've already been gaming out how to uh, uh, push the mail option as much as possible for voting by mail. And the Secretary of State is working on legislation, which I think might have gone through today, that would also push that at the state level and would provide money to cover the costs of it to municipalities. So, so yeah, those conversations are underway. Thank you. Great. Um, so I would love to talk a little bit more about the budgetary impacts. Um, I know we got an email from Kelly earlier, uh, but wondering if you could outline that a little bit. Um, and then I, I'm so glad that Bill Kaplan from the Montpelier Development Corporation was able to join us. And so I'd love to um, talk a little bit about that uh, in a, you know, well, well, it's up to you which um, which sequence you go. We, you you all had invited uh, Montpelier Live and MDC to this meeting to talk to them about what they were doing on behalf of the local businesses. So, um, 
they're here now, but we can we can do it in whichever order you like. Well, um, Bill, I don't know if you have a preference. Since you're here, maybe we can talk about the MGC. I, I think we really um, just wanted to uh, touch base with you uh, and the MGC in general about um, what you all are thinking uh, about the current crisis and how um, the MDC um, money could be used towards um, even just helping preserve um, downtown uh, businesses. Uh, if, if I could just share an update before Bill Kaplan goes. Sure. Um, Go we had been receiving some conflicting information all day, including from the governor's press conference and some other things. Um, but we, it had initially seemed like uh, many retail stores would be allowed to stay open if they only did pick up or delivery services. Um, that was the initial guidance we heard from the downtown program and um, what the governor and uh, Secretary Curley said in the press conference earlier today. We have just received word that that is not the case um, and that it is indeed that um, almost essentially all non-essential businesses will need to close. Um, the, there are some exceptions which include uh, restaurants, food service, um, including food stores and specialty food stores, uh, automobile supplies, pet food, but, you know, there's certain exceptions where they can keep serving uh, folks. Um, but uh, retail businesses are only going to be allowed to operate with the proprietor themselves. Uh, so just the one proprietor of the business can still fulfill orders um, that can be shipped. Uh, or potentially it seems like if they do zero contact delivery, that would probably be acceptable, but the pickup is no longer uh, going to be an option. So there had been a lot of businesses that were still open downtown um, that were doing a curbside pickup um, or, you know, still had staff working and fulfilling deliveries, um, and that will no longer be the case. So unfortunately, it's um, a worse case scenario than we were anticipating earlier in the day and I'm just that's why I've been in and out and distracted if you've been looking at my video feed because um, I've just been getting this information in the last like five minutes so I'm um, working on communicating that to folks presently um, but but that is the that is the update so I think that's important for you to know in the context of the rest of the conversation. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, Bill, would love to just hear any thoughts you all have on the current situation. Um, it's a little hard to hear you there. Doesn't look like you're muted. <laughs> Did he check his volume? Is that better? Yes. Oh, nope. what happened? <sighs> oh. Seems like we either get your picture or your uh, voice. Oh, got it. We we heard you there for a second. Okay, now. Yes. Yeah. All right. I apologize for the delay. Okay. Uh, some of it has to do with fat fingers, and some of it is thick head. Uh, let's see. So, the uh, first, thank you all. I mean, amazing to see everybody in their different places working hard on this, and um, these are very trying, trying times. Um, I think that um, we've had, you know, MDC has had uh, a, an emergency meeting, um, a, a board meeting. We've talked, uh, Dan and I spoke this morning. Uh, I think that, you know, the first thing I'd like to say is that the, out of the conversation this morning with Dan, MDC will be um, funding some help for Dan. Um, 
uh, with uh, a kind of a, a resource person that would come in. Uh, and I think that one of the pieces here is going to be after the after this um, wave of closures and everything else happens, um, there's going to be a need for people to tend to their businesses. And at the same time, there are all these resources and and programs and insurances and things that that you know it, it's going to um, take a level of expertise. And as any of us know, even just making an insurance claim takes a lot of time for these government programs, whether it's the SBA or some of the federal programs or, or tax relief. Uh, I think there's going to be a need for some assistance and some expertise and someone who's got to open their open up their their business again will need some help and so uh i think dan has been kind of the front line and and really handling communications and i and i think instead of redundancy we'd like to slip in underneath and and fund uh, a support person for dan who would be specifically kind of a um a, a community resource for uh you know assisting people in their recovery and uh and accessing their uh, the resources that are available. Uh, that said, you know, economic development is this. Uh, we've talked about this long-term horizon piece. This is a whole new way of looking at it, and we do have funds. Um, and you know, MDC is willing to kind of give the funds over to whatever efforts the city believes they should be used for. We don't have, um, you know, the, the team and the, and, the, and the board are geared for projects and long-term things, not for this type of crisis. That said, every one of us is, um, you know, working hard both in the community and, and at the jobs. Everyone at the board meeting was talking about incredibly long hours. I mean, you know, as, as we're speaking, things are happening. It, it is a, it is a, uh, a trying time. And so I think that if there's a way that MDC funds can be put to use in the immediate, uh, it is, it's, uh, you know, that MDC is open to that. We just don't have, uh, as you know, we, we have this project manager, um, system. So we have that for, you know, to help, uh, Dan, if there's another way to do it, if, if it's just a complete relinquishment, however it works, you know, um, MDC is, is looking for the best path forward and, um, and, uh, you know, we're just open to, um, seeing what happens, uh, but also if, 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 if there's something that needs more immediate attention, then, you know, you'll just need to let us know. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Um, Dan, do you have something to add? Um, so I'll just talk uh, briefly about what we've been doing. Um, I hope that you've seen our communications around businesses that are open and closed and takeout options and all of that. We've had thousands of people visit our website to get that information and we've been working hard to keep it up to date. Um, some days we've had as many as 60 updates to make in a single day on that web page. Um, so it's been pretty constant. Um, we've been doing a, a promotional campaign. Um, I don't know if you've seen the bridge today, but the back page of the bridge, the front of the Times Argus, every day in every single issue of Front Porch Forum, paid Facebook, paid Instagram, all that uh, to try and get out the word about how people can continue to support downtown businesses, um, pushing the idea of gift cards as a way for businesses to get cash flow. Um, we've been, um, I've been on many, many conference calls, email chains, et cetera, trying to get, you know, the most recent information out to businesses. Um, you may or may not know that there's a downtown business Facebook chat group that's pretty active and has been especially active during this period. I've also been sending out email updates both to um, members, but also to 
basically every business owner whose email that I have. So I want to be clear that we've been offering our services to anyone who I can get in touch with. Um, uh, sending out emails basically every other day um, to business owners. That's on top of the Facebook conversations that we've had and individual phone calls. I've had many um, one-on-one calls, video chats, et cetera, with business owners talking about their specific needs, um, help some folks set up online operations, which uh, will be able to continue in some limited capacity in this new world. So hopefully that will serve them well. Um, You know, connecting people with resources like the SBA loans, there's the initial round of SBA loans is available, not the broader federal stimulus package that um, hasn't been approved yet, but an early round of SBA loans. Um, Connecting people with business advisors, other resources, you know, providing suggestions, all of that. and that's in addition to the public updates. Um, you know, we've been doing the daily email newsletter and the daily Facebook live chat, um, if you've been seeing that, um, and trying to be as active as possible on social media to get out the word. Um, you know, we've had conversations with various people at various points who have suggested starting some kind of fund. You know, I, that's kind of what Bill. Kaplan was referring to just now in terms of providing funding to some resource pool. Um, I think uh, the challenge that we keep running up Actually, against. That's, that's, I don't mean to interrupt, but that isn't what I was talking about. I was talking about the, the person that we talked about as a, as a resource. Okay. Well, there's, you know, the possibility that some funding be made available from whoever for some kind of pool, whether it's pri- donations, private funders, foundations, NBC, Montpelier, Live, the city, whoever it is. Um, But there's a lot of challenges around um, how that's administered, who is eligible, what are the criteria, Um, you know, it's complicated um, and, uh, you know, there could easily be hundreds of eligible businesses in Montpelier alone. And so, you know, if we're talking about $10,000 $10,000 or even $100,000, um, it's not going to add up to much per business. I think um, any real support, we're looking towards uh, state and federal response for businesses. Um, we've been advocating, and a lot of other people have been advocating for as many um, grant options as opposed to loan options for businesses. Um, I've heard loud and clear from a lot of businesses that taking on more debt in whatever form that is, that including, you know, as, as helpful as things like deferred tax payments and water sewer bills and things like that are, um, ultimately that's essentially a form of a loan. You know, it has to be paid back at some point in the future. And businesses are operating on pretty slim margins as it is. Um, and so taking on this additional debt when they don't know whether they're going to be able to repay it is a concern that people have. The uh, stimulus package that's you know agreed upon federally, um, it looks like it does uh, include some loan forgiveness type programs, um, uh, loans that can turn into grants if businesses follow certain criteria. Um, I was on a call with Vermont uh, Businesses for Social Responsibility and Congressman Welch this morning, and he said there are not any answers yet on any of the rules of what that ends up looking like. So, um, you know, we're trying to get clarity around. It, it seems like if businesses agree to keep their employees on payroll, that they will then be eligible for these gr- grants as opposed to loans or loan forgiveness in some form but it's unclear what that looks like um, in terms of, does that mean everyone has to stay on payroll? Can you reduce hours? How long do you have to keep people on payroll? Uh, You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, And it's all very unclear when people are gonna get access to any funds. Um, I've had a few people who have tried to apply for that first round of SBA loans and said, you know, the website took an hour to go from one page to the next. 
you know, the same kind of thing people are running into with filing unemployment claims, all this, you know, all the systems are just super overloaded. Um, so it, it seems like a lot of people are think they can eke by their March, like payments, rent payments are a big one that people are concerned about. Um, but there's a lot of concern about April. And obviously we don't know what April looks like uh, at all. Um, but it's hard to imagine a scenario in which we're back to full economic activity in much of April, um, you know, unlike what President Trump might want to say. Um, so, you know, I, there's a lot of, I'm hearing a lot of fear. I'm hearing a lot of, um, you know, there's just so much uncertainty on every level and not very many answers. And so, you know, trying to support people in the ways that we can, um, but ultimately we're gonna need the federal and state support to have any real impact on saving people. Okay, well, thank you for that. Any questions or comments uh, for either Bill or Dan at this point? Uh, Dan and then Jay. Well, um, I'll just thank both of you for the work you're doing, Dan, uh, particularly. I mean, that's uh, huge lifting that you're doing, especially with that web page. Um, but, you know, I guess the, the question is, is that um, has anyone reached out to the, the landlords for these businesses that, you, you know, as to whether there's any need for sort of intervention in in either rent payments or types of forgiveness that's going to create instability in the business right away with the april rent pay yeah so we've encouraged people to reach out to their landlords but i'll remind you that it's not like we have huge corporate landlords in montpelier um you know it would be one thing if brookfield's properties owned all the buildings in montpelier but i'll give the example of my you know where my wife's store is the building is owned by Kelly Sullivan, who's another downtown store owner. Um, you know, Eric Bigglestone of Capital Stationers owns the building that Walgreens is in. So, um, you know, there's a lot of these small landlords and they're grappling with the same problems as anyone else. Um, you know, they have tenants who are struggling to make payments or need flexibility, but they're not, you know, they need the relief from their lenders or from whoever it is. So. It, you know, there's a yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm not that somehow. I mean, because I think we have a downtown landlord here on the on the line with Bill. Um, but I mean, at the same time, has there been that conversation, or is there any sense about, you know, is this the first big crisis that these businesses are going to face, or is there something else? You know, you, you mentioned April, but I'm I'm curious in breaking down what part of April are causing fear uh, and I think that people are having conversations with their individual landlords and um, it they're trying you know from what I understand landlords are trying to be as flexible as they can be um, you know I think if it's a matter of getting the payment at the end of April instead of the beginning of April, landlords will probably be flexible about that and you know some people have been talking about payment plans or other things but um ultimately the landlord has to make their mortgage payment and their you know xyz payments too so and you know bill maybe you could speak to this bill kaplan could probably speak to this as a from the landlord perspective mm -hmm. well i mean it, it is um it's an ongoing conversation i talk to tenants every day um and in and, and, and Montpelier, where it's a startup, um, you're not necessarily a startup, but it's a new new location for Rival Rouser. Um, you know, we're in touch once or twice a day, um, working out things, and and uh, I have some resource lists that I have been sharing with all all the tenants. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, different cities and states have been dealing with this differently, and. Um, I think that as things unfold, there will be programs and, and things like that. Um, I did talk to a, um, 
a banker today in Montpelier. Um, my, my, I don't have any, you know, commercial loans in, um, in, in that I was talking to them about, but it was, it was a, um, but they are, you know, when people ask for, um, relief, they are willing oftentimes to put the, um, deferred payments at the end and extend the loan. Um, so that there are, there are options for, for, uh, for landlords and then those, Benefits, even if it's just a suspension of uh, go to only uh, interest, interest only, or, or payments like that. Some of that, there is a little bit of, um, you know, kind of slack in the line that can be uh, moved down to to tenants, and I think that's part of what this um, resource person could could work on with people. Um, you know, we're what we're thinking about is, you know, um, maybe a retired banker or someone who's embedded in the community already who knows. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the players and also understand kind of bureaucracies and, and pieces like that so that we can in real time and, and afterwards um, position ourselves. I mean, there are, there's so many conflicting uh, reports of whether, you know, you, 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 people who are, who are kept on the payroll will be reimbursed. People who are relieved will have, get full 100% um, unemployment, you know, I just think it's so um, amorphous right now. And there's, there are so many pieces that it really does make sense to kind of support and triage at this point. And, and then really, if we can be the best informed downtown about how to make use of the resources available, it will give us um, a, a quicker recovery. That's, I, that's the theory behind what we'd like to do. Um, not sure that's answering any question you asked, but no, that that that's actually very helpful, and I, I appreciate both both of your responses. Um, you know, I think it, it it makes sense, at least to me, that that right now we're sort of in a triage state, and you know, but at the same time, we have to be looking to position ourselves to take advantage of these recovery instruments as they as they come out but you know first and foremost right now it, it, it strikes me that a lot of these businesses you know they have to have the conversations like your tenants are having with you bill or you know and, and understanding that that as dan pointed out you know it's not a bunch of faceless corporate landlords these are their neighbors and other downtown businesses so i think that's really helpful and obviously anything that the city can do I, I i think we can make it take out tuesday and we can call it fill up the freezer on friday and get people getting you know pre-made pizzas and and all that putting them in the freezer don't buy the ones in the supermarket buy them from positive pie buy them from from you know you can now you can now order a a, a really nice piping hot pizza and it will come with beer to your house so <laughs> all those things I, are I'm, Unfortunately, unfortunately, restaurants are not actually allowed to deliver only uh, liquor stores, only if you have a class two license. Uh, I, some folks are not maybe following that rule, but uh, I don't think anyone here is going to complain too much. But um, the official <laughs> official state uh, guidance. I think, you can, I think in Montpelier, you can, you can order, you can make such orders. A, a class one is not allowed to deliver. A class two license is free. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Jay, did you have a, a question? Um, yeah, just real quick, I'll, I'll echo Dan Richardson's uh, sentiment about uh, Bill and, and Dan uh, Groberg, the work you're doing. It's uh, it's really appreciated. Um, and I, I just want to, um, you know, in, in these really trying times, and, and Dan Groberg, I just want to, I think, uh, uh, support your instincts in that uh, around the idea that Montpelier Live, even with the support of the MDC, could actually be some sort of fund to support businesses. You know, we, the, as an organization, the, the pockets just aren't deep enough. There's too many businesses in Montpelier to really make an impact, um, you know, financially, you know, and spread it equally. There's so many deserving businesses in town that that need the support. So I think 
steering people, steering customers towards businesses, and then also supporting those businesses in in connecting with resources that the state and federal government make make available really will have the most long-term impact. And to that point, um, Bill, I, I love the idea of uh, the MDC supporting Montpelier Live, who you're right, is more sort of on the ground with on a day-to-day -day basis with local businesses and you know, supporting some human resources to be able to consult and work with um, those businesses to navigate these times. It seems to me, it, it seems to me like you're actually talking about two different things. And I don't know, maybe there's that person that can um, cover all this ground. But on one hand, yes, you, you've got some, you like you said, you're looking for somebody who can be there and be a resource and help navigate the financial challenges that the businesses are having, meaning, all right, how do they approach different loans and um, or grants, and how do they, you know, are they are they moving on to something that's an interest only or negotiating with their, um, you know, with their landlords, et cetera. But then there's this, also this very immediate piece, it seems to me, that you've both alluded to, that is trying to wrap their heads around what the state and federal government are offering and what's available to businesses like and it's changing hour by hour, right? So I, I don't know if that person exists that can bridge the gap between sort of managing, you know, what they're what 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 businesses are doing with employees, how they're managing unemployment, how they're you know what they're eligible for, what should they be applying for an SBA loan? What are what are things that are existing, but then also trying to wrap their head around what is available to them immediately. Um, even, even local lending institutions, you know, uh, the SECU, you know, announced the, you know, two thousand dollar emergency loan, zero percent type, you know, thing uh, that's available right now to individuals and businesses. Um, is you know, it's not uh, not available for businesses. Available and then also, what's what's the what's the best approach? I think I just worry that it, it could convolute, and I appreciate. Yeah, so we've been playing that immediate role. Montpelier Live has been playing that immediate role um, in terms of telling people what's available. Um, that specific DSCC loan is for individuals only, I'm afraid, not businesses. But um, so we, yeah, we've been telling people what's available. You know, like North Country Federal Credit Union has a, a loan that's available to businesses. Um, you know, the SBA loans that are available right now, we're anticipating that the VITA loans will be available relatively soon, as soon as the legislature can get its act together um, at the state, uh, you know, they can't even figure out whether they need a quorum or not. So I don't know. Um, but uh, so, um, you know, we're, we've been providing that information to people. I, I, we don't, there is no comprehensive database of every single business in Montpelier. Um, I have been attempting to, you know, I've been telling people share every communication I send out, share this far and wide, but um, I'm sure there are people that I'm missing. Um, so, you know, anything that can be done, you know, I think the city has been doing some level of sharing the information that, that we get out, but um, mostly the things we've been sending to business owners have not been sort of public facing documents that could be shared. Um, because we, we don't want to confuse the customers, you know, with information that's relevant to businesses and maybe not to them. So, um, you know, it's a balancing act. Uh, Lauren. Um, thank you both for all the work that's going into this. I mean, what an incredibly challenging time. Um, I guess my question is, you know, I hear you loud and clear that like the real game changer kinds of things or what whatever the federal and state government could do to support our local businesses through this time. Um, and I think the idea of having people there to help navigate that makes a lot of sense to me. So that's a great idea. Thanks for bringing that forward. Um, I guess I'm also wondering kind of uh, what Dan mentioned of, 
you know, it, it sounds like it's not game changer kind of stuff, the things that the city has done or could do, but are there ideas um, of what the city can be doing specifically? I mean, knowing we're going to be ch facing a really challenging budget situation, um, but are there things that, you know, keep money in people's pockets for enough time as they're working through the, um, you know, loan application process? Are, are there things that you think the city should be looking into um, that would be helpful that, um, you know, you're seeing in other cities or any other ideas that you hope would be on our, um, on our list to look into? Um, certainly clarifying, I know when the um, guidance came out about the property taxes, there was a statement that said like the city would also look into the water sewer bills, which are actually due before the property taxes, if I have my timeline straight. Um, so clarifying if it is indeed the fact that people can delay the water sewer payments. Um, if there's any other, you know, there's not much that's really within the city's control. Um, parking permits are maybe something, but they're usually paid annually or every six months or something like that. Um, you know, a lot of businesses have downtown parking permits. Um, ultimately, there's not a ton, and I, and I certainly recognize and respect that the city doesn't, you know, that the city has these financial challenges coming forward also. Um, you know, I Burlington, you know, just put a million dollars towards this resource pool, part of which is going to go to businesses through um, their community economic development office, but they had at Burlington Telecom proceeds, special one-time proceeds that they applied towards it. Um, you know, we're not in that position. Um, the one thing that I will say that might be helpful is, um, and this goes beyond the business community, is that um, some kind of task force at the city level coordinating you know, I, I don't know that there's necessarily communication between like the schools and the city and the business community and that, you know, like just at the city level, um, so smaller than what a bill had mentioned in terms of that um, regional effort that I can't remember the name, um, but, uh, you know, something at the city level to get, have everyone thrive, thank you, Anne, uh, to have everyone uh, talking to each other. Uh, Donna. Oh, oh I sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Bill. Bill. You know, because I think that the city could look towards some non-monetary um, pieces, and I and I have seen uh, some other towns and cities establishing kind of new norms, uh, at least new temporary norms, and uh, and that idea of like the city tonight voting on takeout Tuesday and refresh your freezer Friday. You know, and and with local foods, I think that you can you can do things like that. It just gets people back into some of their um, reestablishing some patterns and some habits, and it, and that little bit helps a lot. I have um, elsewhere. I have a I have a pizza shop, and they're down to uh, you know half of their business, but they're doing it only in pizzas and only in frozen and takeout, and it and it does. It does help. It lets them keep stay employed, lets them, you know, kind of normalize and get through. Um, and I think that there is some of that that can happen um, in Montpelier, even with these restrictions that Dan was talking about. You know, people are um, people are there and trying. And I think the city can do some things just by getting it in the paper that they've declared this or, or other pieces like that, 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 I don't know, I try and be hopeful about that. It's interesting, the idea of non-monetary supports or encouragement. Um, well, certainly, um, and I emailed, they may already be on it, but I emailed Bill Prazier and Seth this morning about it, but linking directly from the city webpage to our Montpelier Live business update page that's pretty simple, you know, sharing that kind of stuff on Facebook as often as possible, making sure that anytime you're doing an update about city operations, that you're also reminding people about that kind of thing. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Donna, did you have something? Uh, yeah, I was just taking a little different picture, but since you, you have these businesses involved, I, I'd like to get a better idea of a long-term need, such as what's the minimum it would take to keep businesses open and start gathering information on that so that we can look at our resources, not just for today, but more long-term, because I see several months ahead and I, I'd like to have what that would take so then we can start looking at resources differently. That's all. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'll just say, you know, so much of this ultimately depends on how long we're talking about. Um, I think that most, although not all, businesses could probably weather two months. Um, but then, you know, the further down the road we start getting, you know, even the businesses that we think of as the strongest anchor businesses in Montpelier might start feeling it. So, um, yeah, I, I, but I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I think even, even this, you know, even three weeks, I think we'll probably see some businesses that, that can't make it through. Um, you know, I, I think there are resources going to be made available, but whether they come soon enough, whether the, you know, as many resources and opportunities as we provide, you know, ultimately it's dependent on the business to access them. Um, so, you know, there may be some people who just don't, you know, who can't make it work, um, you know, who, who aren't able to apply for the SBA loan, even with handholding or, or whatever the case may be. So, um, or have such fundamental underlying business challenges, you know, who may already be on the brink, for instance, um, who, uh, you know, who don't make it through this. So, um, I, I mean, but I'll also say that ultimately, um, though the businesses themselves are not, you know, making it rich, our commercial real estate market is quite strong. Um, you know, we see pretty low vacancy rates downtown. Um, I think there will probably be some, I know there's some people who have previously expressed interest in opening downtown who haven't been able to find a space downtown. You know, so there may be some new opportunities. The labor market may be a little bit more open for people. That's been a huge challenge for downtown businesses is accessing labor, especially for the restaurants. Um, you know, <laughs> if there is- But, but Dan, I do think, I think uh, Jay used the term triage, or maybe it was Dan. But yeah. I think at some point, we have to step back and maybe be a little more pessimistic, just as the hospitals are doing, as saying, who's going to be first served? And making some tough choices as to what businesses can hold on, because it's going to be more than one month. It's going to be probably more than three, four. Um, and have an idea of where to put the best attention of what we have. I think we may have to do some of that assessment. And so we can't do that without people being willing to at least base share some information of what their reality is, if they can go two, three, six months. Well, I, I mean, I, I, I think I hear Donna's point about, um, you know, obviously if there's a business that's about to go under, we don't want to put resources into it that, that's not going to stop the inevitable. But at the same time, I think we have to be very careful about picking winners and losers in this kind of situation. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that you're suggesting that, but I think we just have to be really, really careful because, you know, this is one of those situations where it's going to be um, a lot of businesses that may not make a decision until the end. Um, but I, but you I, can't do it without information, though. No, I agree. I, I mean, I agree. It's like the doctors take a patient in and they get information and they try to make some assessment. That's all. I'm just saying we shouldn't keep our head in the ground and, and avoid no, it. No, and, and I've, been asking, Absolutely. I've been asking businesses to be as transparent as they can be. Um, you know, historically, businesses are not typically eager to share their uh, sales information, even when we're trying to be helpful to them and promise confidentiality. Um, I, I think you know, we're, we're doing our best to tell people that, but I, I certainly don't. I appreciate what you're saying about triaging and, and I appreciate, and 
you know, on some level agree, Dan, with what you're saying about we don't want to be putting money into businesses that are already failing, but um, I don't think anyone wants to be in the position of having to choose choose winners and losers. Um, you know, that's an impossible task. As the city council figures every year when they try and set their budget, you know, you just only winners at the, with the city council. So. Well, and it, it may, um, you know, in, in terms of like, you know, winners and losers, uh, that may depend on whether or not we have funds to actually, uh, for the city, you know, to be able to um, leverage. And, uh, you know, based on the conversation I think we're going to have, I'm not sure that we do have a lot of <laughs> excess funds um, anyway. So, uh, but, uh, anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Any further questions for either Dan or Bill? Okay. Well, thank you for uh, taking a little time. Um, and we certainly are interested to know uh, if there's anything further that you think this city can be doing. I'm intrigued by this idea of takeout Tuesdays and and freezer Fridays or whatever, um, or any other you know non monetary supports that we can offer. I am still interested in figuring out if there's ways that we can, um, uh, if, if we do have funds, um, what might be the best use of those. Um, but thank you, Bill, for your openness about, you know, being willing to take suggestions. Um, you know, I, I agree with the, the council as well, you know, being able to offer uh, the support of, um, you know, someone who knows how to navigate um, other funds, I think, will be uh, will be useful. So, um, if no one had no one else has can, any further, can I just add one thing on this? Um, yes, Bill, go ahead. I just since we're all here in public and everyone's here, I just want to say I've been stopped. Uh, in the last week by two different downtown businessmen. Just, they have, both happen to be men um, to compliment Dan Groberg. Uh, yeah, I think maybe not understanding the the relation the work relationship, thinking that somehow he's connected to the city, but to go out of the way to talk about what an extraordinary job he is doing, and I think we should recognize that. I've seen it, certainly seen it, and uh, make sure he gets the credit uh, while he's here in front of us, all of us. Uh, but these were unsolicited people pulled me aside to tell me that. So. Clap. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Well, and I'll, I'll pass a lot of that credit on to my employee, Ashley, which thanks to your increased support in this year's budget, I, we were able to hire that person. And she's been in charge of most of the website updates while I've been dealing with the business owners and the bigger picture stuff. So uh, she's been like sick of me forwarding her emails with us <laughs> update the website. So um, thank you. Thank her for us. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, um, I think all that leads into a um, conversation about the city's situation. Okay. Um, Can we have a take break? Take care. Sorry? Thank you all. Can we have a break? It's like, you know, 8.30, 8.40? Uh, other folks, do you want a break? Sure. Just, just five minutes? Sure. Okay. Yeah, let's take, take five minutes. Well, how about let's reconvene back at um, 8.00. 45. That's like four minutes. Is that okay? okay? Okay. We'll take about five minutes. Thank you. She's, and just so you okay. know, um, she's sitting where she is so that you all can see her face while she's talking, but her back is to the screen so she can't see your faces. It's just kind of a little awkward. So, so she I, can, can do the side thing. That's easier. Yeah. Than that's why I was trying to sit <laughs> on the side, but. So um, good. Thank you. They'll be able to see you fine. Great. All right. Good. That, that works for me, just as long as it works for everybody else. Um, so I did send um, talking points earlier tonight just because I wanted to get um, those out before the meeting. Um, we have been working quite a bit on the budget since the last um, meeting, and so I kind of wanted to put out there, you know, some of the questions that you had asked us, um, which were, you know, looking at FY20 and 21 with an eye towards freeing up money for community assistance. Um, and then number two was a review of the property tax structure as it relates to first floor retail to consider abatement that might be offered for delinquency. Um, and so we have looked into things. I mean, and so the long story short, just kind of getting into it is this will be a problem in 20 and it will be a problem in 21. And we're just trying to figure out 
what that means. Um, you know, during the budget development cycle, we hold things pretty tight, so the margins are pretty thin. Um, we have evaluated sort of the budget to actual line items, and we've also looked at capital expenditures by way of projects, but then also looking at equipment. And so um, there's not a whole lot to free up, especially when we're trying to kind of assess where we're going to come down in all of this. Um, so right now, it is looking like we're going to have a revenue shortfall, um, and you know that's attributable to uh, parking and also to local options taxes. And so that's the tune of about $210,000 um, that we've got to try to figure out how we're going to make that up. Um, and so we're looking at everything. The department heads um, have reviewed their budgets. We do have information that we're vetting right now to see what we can come up with. Um, you know, there are some viable, you know, things on the table. And so we're scraping by, but, um, you know, there'd be more to come on that plan. It's just in terms of being able to free up money that then doesn't go towards, you know, dealing with the deficit that, that we'll be facing with the revenues um, is going to be tricky. Um, so I can't see you all right now, so I'm going to do a quick look in back of me and see how it's going. Um, looks good. Okay. So far, so good. Um, you know. Well, actually, can I can I interrupt you? I'm yes, sorry. Please. So you said that there's a, a revenue... Um, Shortfall, and yes. that before, or I'm sorry, is that uh, is that after um, we've looked for you know delaying equip equipment purchases or projects? So some of the the um, things that we have on the table right now will go towards offsetting that, um, and so we're trying to figure out. Well, right now, based on what we know, how bad is it? Um, but then we're also in unprecedented times and. We just don't know how long this thing will go. I mean, we're projecting out to the end of the fiscal year, but even then, you know, the implications could be far reaching. And so we're trying to be really conservative and making sure that we have enough to get by in 20, but then into 21 so we can focus on core operations um, and, you know, keep the city running for our residents. Is that kind of probably yeah, not the answer you. you were hoping for, <laughs> but no, I that's also okay. want to get it out there. I'm just going to jump in here to kind of try to distill that down. We've got you know, the budget was already tight. We were probably have, going to have to tighten the belt just to to make it anyway before this all happened, and with um, so we're definitely you know. You know, by our choice and appropriately, we are uh, foregoing parking revenue. We're also probably foregoing or going to lose the uh, almost all of our rooms, meals, and alcohol tax. We haven't even we don't have a hard number yet on what our like rec and senior center fees that we would have brought in yet. That we're we're still calculating those numbers. So you know, if you have if we're going to be slightly spending over budget and we've got this shortfall. You know, just to just to make that gap work, and keep our core city functions going, um, that will include canceling some of the projects and delaying equipment and those kinds of things that you've you've talked about. And we're trying to get a handle on that. The, part of the problem we have is we're we're already you know into March, almost into April. A, a lot of that stuff's been bought in F, in our current fiscal year. So. We have more flexibility for the following fiscal year, but we don't know yet whether by July 1, everything will be back up and running and we'll just be back business as usual, or we'll be still in the midst of um, what, you know, I, I think this is gonna be longer, not shorter, but I don't know that any better than anybody else. So, you know, as, as time goes by, we'll be able to figure out what what our choices going into the next fiscal year are, but um, right now we're trying to just see how we can bring the ship home in our, our current year and not not have too deep a deficit to carry forward into an, another year. Um, so that's where we're at. Um, we're finalizing numbers. Like I said, we actually have a team meeting tomorrow morning to go over this in more detail, and our plan is to have a much more detailed plan for you for the next meeting. Um, but is the first weather report. That's where we're at. So, um, 
you know, with that, you know, I, some of the things that we also did want a little bit of guidance on. Well, actually, before I jump into that, I, I kind of wanted to give you sort of a, a rundown of what we can anticipate in property taxes and, you know, a normal cycle in the fourth quarter, we would be expecting about $2.5 million to be coming in. Um, thankfully, looking at the um, delinquencies in the past, we um, our residents pay their property taxes, which is awesome. Um, but then we've also had comments from, you know, auditors and the like that have said, wow, you know, you really get your property taxes. And so that's great. I did take a look back to the Great Recession to see if maybe we saw a blip there, you know, and revenues coming in and we didn't. Um, but this is also different. So there's that caveat. Um, but I did sort of track to see, you know, what we have coming in automatically in payments. So that's about 1.1 million dollars um, and so there's about 1.4 that then you know comes in through you know taxpayer initiated payments um, so that's where some of I think the risk is um, and then that being said you also did ask me to look into the um, downtown you know business district and sort of what that looks like and so this is a higher level level figure in terms of being um, representative of commercial spaces but then also um, you know, apartments and the like. And so that's about 760K. So it's just good to, I think, think about that in terms of um, thinking about, you know, who's impacted most by this pandemic and what we would be looking at, um, you know, in terms of exposure um, and, you know, where people might come in. And so it's just a, a, a thing to note, um, just based on what you had asked. Um, and then, you know, additionally, uh, Moving on to the next thing that I wanted to mention is that we do have some other budgeted or non-budgeted things that are coming up that we should really talk about that may play into this. And you know, um, we've you know got an elevator that we need to service, um, and I can you know list off the the price tags associated. But um, you know, we we have a property that we need to figure out what we're going to do with, um, and then we've got the reappraisal, which is kind of a big ticket item that we'll have to figure out. And so these things would be happening anyway. Um, so it's just kind of weighing them against our current situation. And so that's also some food for thought in terms of thinking about what we have for resources and what we have to pay for coming up. Um, it's just a, a, a reality. Um, so then that sort of leads into, you know, finally thinking about, you know, when we think about what we're doing and how we can best support the community, what that looks like. And, you know, is it core services or are there other additional items that are maybe not necessarily traditional base budget items um, that, you know, may need to come off the table if, you know, we want to remain whole and to keep doing what we're doing um, in terms of providing city residents with the support that they need. Um, and so some of those items, just to kind of lay them out, would be, you know, they'd be hard to, to think about, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it. Um, the Homelessness Tax Force, um, the Ash Borer Fund, Montpelier Development Corporation, which I know we just heard from them, and that was a really good discussion, um, the Social Justice Grant, and then the Arts Fund. So it's just, some, those are some of the things, and that's about $190,000 of discretionary items, but, you know, thinking about, you know, what, do we really need to fund and what are we funding and it's all good um, but it might be in terms of prioritizing where our resources are going you know what things stay and what things go or what things come back online once we have you know a better revenue picture um, it's just some things to consider and so that's kind of what I'm hoping will resonate but then we'll have more of a plan um, for sure as we get on here because we would already be looking into the closing out of this fiscal year and then with this um, crisis we just really need to be careful so I can't see you so I'm going to turn around uh, Dan yeah I had a question about the reappraisal is is the reappraisal have we reached a threshold where it has to happen or is this just um, you know is that it do we have any options as far as the timing of that um, so it, it does need to happen, but I'm going to turn it over to Bill. So we are about to hit the threshold. 
Um, and I think what's we've been trying to uh, preview this in the weekly memo for a while. Um, the state recently changed the threshold from uh, people at 80 percent uh, of common level of appraisal to 85 percent. So it's a high, you know, you hit it faster. Because of that, many more communities are, are hitting it. And so the demand for reappraisal firms is sort of at all time high. So most of them are booking three years out. So our strategy had been to put out an RFP, book a firm for like 23 or 24, um, and start setting money aside because it's a big ticket item. And we're going to have to do it. We're going to be ordered to do it. But um, the, the time being what it is, it, you know, up until this crisis, we were thinking time was on our side for this. And it still may be, but it's just something to consider when we think about hitting the future is right. that's out there. And we, you know, we know we have this $134,000 property liability in December. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll choose to sell the property after what we just heard from the, the downtown plan, but we don't, we don't know that yet. And, um, and we have an elevator that is, uh, you know, on its last legs. And we just recently got a cost estimate saying really what you need to do is overhaul the, the whole thing for a hundred thousand dollars. And that's unexpected, but we, for us to have an accessible building, we have to have a functional elevator. So, you know, and those are normal sure. budget challenges, but when you add those considerations into a budget shortfall and trying to, you know, and and support, you know, we're 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 really looking at everything. What what functions, you know, are we not doing right now? Are there, are there cuts that we can make there? So it's it's a, not an easy sure. discussion. No, I just especially with the reappraisal, it, it it struck me as something that if there because it is a such a big ticket item and b, um, you know something that either the state could waive or that, you know, depending on the circumstances where we were at. And I also wonder even if, you know, we are going to see any type of downturn taking a hit on property values, which may change our numbers. Uh, so we stop being closer to the edge. Um, but anyway, I just wanted more clarification. I appreciate that, Bill. Thanks. Other questions, uh, Lauren? Um, I guess just one thing picking up on the reappraisal. I mean, I don't know if that's something that PLCT or other communities will maybe be asking for a delay. I mean, the kinds of things that in this kind of emergency, maybe the state could give a five-year window or something as people are rebuilding to not be putting money towards that right now. So maybe we could think about something like that. Um, we could help advocate for. Um, I imagine a lot of communities are in the same boat. Um, and then I guess, is there any like learnings from 2008, like when the era money came out um, or, you know, are there any expectations? I mean, obviously it's just so unknown right now, but you know, would you have any guess still having, you know, been through upturns and downturns of the economy of what kind of um, you know, federal help might possibly help cover any of this, or is that just not <laughs> just too unknown at this point? Um, in in two thousand and eight, it it all went really went to infrastructure, um, and we were able to use some of that uh, for fixing up a few projects. I mean, the biggest we got the biggest energy era grant in the country for the district heat project. That was, I think, our biggest. Uh, sort of turnaround out of that, um, but there were there were other funds that went to various infrastructure. This is, and that was in part because it was designed to put people back to work. Um, you know, create construction projects. You know, so that people will have jobs. I don't know how this will be targeted. It sounds like you know. I mean, hopefully, local governments will will have some opportunities in that. But it's I I would suspect appropriately most of this is going to be targeted to businesses, landlords, employees, maybe even financial institutions who who you know take a hit on mortgages or those kinds of things. I I, I don't know yet what this is all going to look like. But certainly, if there were an infrastructure component, then maybe some of the projects that we delay out of our own budget might be able to be picked up from that. Sure. 
Jack, go ahead. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. Um, thinking about the elevator, am I, I think that's something we talked about in the ADA committee. And am I right in thinking that that's uh, an expenditure that we may be able to get a grant for? Um, yes, you are. Um, and so that's something that has come up and that we are working on looking into and exploring um, still. Um, we, you know, in terms of trying to figure out the sort of the how much is this going to cost us, that's sort of where we've been focused. And now that we have a, a pretty good gauge on that, you know, the next step is looking into the grant and seeing what that would mean for us potentially. Okay, thanks. Connor. I was just going to say, following up on Dan and Lauren, if there is consensus that we should try to get a waiver on the reappraisals, we might want to consider taking a position on that tonight and communicating that, just because it's all moving so fast at the state house. I think that's really interesting. Um, other thoughts on that? Uh, Dan, go ahead. I'll, I'll just, you know, I think we have to be careful because the reappraisal has some constitutional and court imposed conditions on it, you know, the fair market value, there's a lot of case law um, and ink that's been spilled on that. But, you know, obviously, it would, it might make sense to even look at our own numbers first and just see, you know, exactly what our timelines are. Um, and then, you know, Bill can find out if other towns are in the same boat, you know, from the VLCT or otherwise. Um, but you know, ultimately, yeah, I, I think if we're all in the same boat, it's it's one of those things that if everybody has this problem, they'll find a solution for it. How do you feel about that, Bill? Can you look yeah. into that? Oh yeah, Doug, that makes sense. And I, you know, I, I want to be clear. We want to just put those out there. I mean, some of these are normal things that you deal with when you're dealing with a budget. You know, you you're adjusting. I think our only point was we have these big ticket items in light of. A, a, a now what's going to be a significant revenue shortfall, an uncertain FY21, and you know potential demand for reallocating funds somewhere else. So you know you can't make decisions without seeing the whole picture um, and knowing what what you're up against. Well, at least for my part, I mean, I feel like I've had my questions answered. I mean. Uh, you know, one, I, I certainly was hopeful that we would have some funds uh, to have some flexibility with to put towards uh, some kind of relief, but um, sounds like we're going to be just trying to make make our own ends meet. Um, and uh, I know we don't have to make any decisions about that tonight, but um, it's good to have the sort of early warning. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, you know what, so uh, at some point you, may be coming to us, I assume, you may be coming to us to say, you know, we have to make some tough decisions uh, in reallocating funds. Um, and I, I don't know what that timeline looks like or what that decision making process looks like. Because I think sometimes, I mean, you all administratively would just reallocate funds internally um, sometimes. Is that is that correct? That, that's correct, and um, it, it depends on the nature of the decision, but certainly depending on where we come out on this, we'd want everyone to be on board. I mean, you know, we, I mean, obviously if we had to take an emergency action, we would, but um, we'll certainly keep you in the loop all, all the way, and um, it would be good to make, you know, we don't, wouldn't want to, some of it involves, it may, would involve making priority decisions, so uh, even if it's, taking from one project to another you know you should probably weigh in on that um so it's you know we will we will work as in sync with you as we can okay and you'll keep us informed of course yeah yeah of course okay any other um thoughts or comments about yes jay yeah sorry it's just a really rudimentary question i'm just Wondering where that 150k number comes relative to parking. Like how many months does that does that assume that we the meters are off, et cetera? You know, in in, in trying to balance out um, priorities. Thanks. 
For sure. So um, it's about three months. Uh, parking is about fifty thousand dollars per month lost, based on our projections at this point. Um, and so that's the kind of long and short estimate of it. We, um, you know, because that's what you pay us to do. We're trying to be cautious, so we took the assumption that um, this wasn't going to all just be over in three weeks. And so we projected basically assuming till the end of the fiscal year, till June 30, that we wouldn't see any really substantial parking revenue. Um, because it's also possible that even if things open up, we might choose to not charge for parking to try to get people coming back downtown and all that sort of thing. Um, but also, similarly, we assumed essentially no more rooms, meals, and alcohol tax during that time frame. Um, I mean, we might get some small little bit, but nothing like if all the restaurants are robustly open and the hotels are full and those kinds of things. So, um, and, and as I said, we also haven't even got into our, our, our other program revenue yet. So we think this is a pretty conservative estimate. You know, ho hopefully we're back in business sooner and it's not as dire, but um, we can't afford to, you know, to be optimistic and uh, really end up in a hole at the end of the year. That all makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Lauren and then Donna. It just on that point, was there any success when we did the holiday, like, donate if you can? I'm just thinking, like, is there something, could we have little signs, like, and it, the Montpelier Live or it goes to something? Like, if you, we, like, I know we turned them off. Like, do you, if you physically put quarters in, does that, is that? I think that's right. I don't know off? if they even take money right now. Okay. Um, but we didn't get a lot. I mean, it was a fun yeah. thing to do. It was a small sum of money that came in. And that was also with a lot of people downtown, you know, parking yeah. and shopping and doing those things. And people are being asked not to come downtown. And there aren't really any stores open for them to come downtown. So, Donna, go ahead. I'm not sure if this question can be done in general session, but it has to do with the parking garage and where we are, but also where Bashero is with hotels being what they are and where what's going on. Uh, just how vulnerable does that make the garage project? I don't have specific information on that, but it's certainly a great question. We do have for the next regularly scheduled meeting an update on the garage project planned be a similar presentation okay, and those kind of things so we will have hopefully real answers to those kind of questions okay thank you um i realize this is uh only sort of related but uh as far as we are aware um has this affected our credit rating at all Sorry, I was like, go ahead. No, no, we're good. <laughs> no, um, it has not. Um, not yet. Not yet, because, you know, we've been able to make all our payments. Again, we remind people, we we borrow our bonds. The, the city doesn't really have a specific individual credit rating like, you know, the state does or maybe the city of Burlington does. We borrow our bonds through the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank, so we're pooled with all the other municipalities in the state. So. The, the bond bank has a, has a bond rating, but the city doesn't have its own bond rating. Our other local borrowing for tax anticipation notes, bond anticipation notes, is really with local banks, and they look at our history of payment and our, um, our I mean, one of the things that's been good for us has been our strong tax collection. Um, and, you know, this, this could change those relationships in the future, but right now it, it hasn't. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a, a couple of things I want to flag, um, sort of separate from this as well, is um, I just want to recognize that Dan Groberg brought up this idea of a task force, um, a, you know, linking uh, different organizations. And I know there's a lot of groups already uh, that have sort of popped up or are um, emerging and um, Anyway, I'm, that's something that, uh, you know, I, I would love to talk with some staff about uh, offline at some point, uh, just about 
taking a um, some kind of a coordinating or um, you know what kind of leadership role makes sense for the city and especially connecting with Thrive. So I, I realize that's a, a separate topic, but um, so just I just briefly, sure I, I said that. So we are connected with Thrive. Um, we were in with their right. organizational call, and they are we're on their phone calls and on their tree and. Um, they're just picking up a lot of the work on the human services, but still in communication with us. Um, you know, the idea of having a connection maybe with the school or a couple of the key organizations, you know, maybe we could arrange one of these Zoom calls, you know, a couple times a week just to touch base with everyone. So I think, you know, I think there's a good opportunity there. Okay. Um, any further comments on, um, on, this, on this topic? Okay. Can I make a uh, all right. comment yeah. just really, really quickly um, related to the consent agenda and um, the bond anticipation note um, that uh, was voted in favor of earlier? Um, I, I need um, you to come down to City Hall tomorrow and sign that, if that's possible, or I can also um, come around and collect signatures. And so I just wanted to kind of get a sense from folks how they wanted to do that, just so we can make that happen um, in as remote a way as possible. These two. And I can also take the liquor licenses too. <laughs> so, or or we can, you know. Um, so I just wanted to um, mention that, and I'm flexible. I, I may have some helpers with Donna. Me. Just saying. Okay, Donna, go ahead. We used to pick up or sign things at the police department. Could they pass it through us their window? We have that. Dis distance between us? I didn't think they I mean, were we'll, open. We'll figure that out and get back Could to Could they you. be? Yeah, they, they Do could. we access it for us to sign papers? They can. I mean, technically, they, yes. You'll have to buzz in, but we can work that out. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. Um, so if that's what you'd like to do, I can make sure that the documents are available there tomorrow. So just let us know when that's set up. Yeah, and then I can just, um, I'll send you an email um, first thing tomorrow and just kind of let you know that they're there. And then um, I'll pick them up at the end of the day and scan them in and give them, get them over to the bank. Just everybody bring hand sanitizer before you sign it. Um, okay. All right, so I'm um, wrapping things up. Yeah, and everybody bring their own pen. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, council reports. Uh, I, I just I'm gonna intuitively go with the order that we normally go in. Um, so I'm gonna start with Donna. I have nothing to say, but thank you all for all your attentiveness, of staff and council members. Thank you. Great, uh, Connor. Uh, just, just one quick thing. I, I think it's fallen through the cracks, but the Red Cross is just at like crisis level as far as blood donations. Uh, just with the schools closing, we had to cancel ours at City Hall, I know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but there is going to be one for people interested on the 30th at the Episcopal Church. Uh, and there's still spots available. So if you want to call 1-800-RED-CROSS, you can get an appointment for that. And it's, uh, that's going to be really important the next few weeks. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Connor. Jay. Um, yes, certainly thanks to all of you and staff and, and for everybody's hard work. I guess um, just one thing that I wanted to add is I, I thought it'd be important to acknowledge um, the leadership that we're seeing from Libby Bonesteel, the superintendent of schools, um, as well as the principals, the uh, teachers and the staff and everybody in the school district. Um, it's been an incredible transition for all of them. Um, and I thought I, if as a parent with three kids in the district, I've just been incredibly impressed by their hard work and their compassion in managing this transition. Um, and so I just wanted to, to acknowledge all the all of their work, which I think is important. And then also um, acknowledge also the, all the parents out there that are uh, trying to not only be uh, teachers and, and, and homeschool their kids, but figure out a way to, to make a living and work from home as well. That's all, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan. Uh, so I want to give a thanks out to um, the groups that have been meeting for the 
capital area neighborhoods, I connected with Dan Jones and gave him a whole list of names of people that were really willing to step forward. And uh, I wasn't able to be a part of the conversation that I think they had today. Um, and maybe you were Ann, and you'll talk about that. But I was just really impressed. You know, one, it's really ha easy to get a hold of people when nobody has meetings or appointments to go to. Um, but two, there's a number of people out there that are willing to step up and step forward in this in this time, and it really great. Thank you, um, Jack. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, again, it's a, all appreciation for what people are doing. Um, everyone who's working on getting services to uh, people without permanent housing, and you know, I'm probably talking to Ken Russell just about every day, and uh, everything they're doing and uh, <clears throat> the creativity which with their, which they're approaching it is really, uh, really tremendous. Um, and, but we're also seeing just great things from from our local residents, you know, all over. People are doing great stuff. I was at Shaw's yesterday shopping for the next two or three weeks or whatever, and I ran into someone I know <clears throat> who said that he's just been devoting his time pretty much full time to volunteering to go shopping for people. and. I was there at lunchtime and he was on his fifth Shaw's run of the day and he said he's usually been doing about uh, 10 trips to Shaw's every day to pick up uh, groceries for people who need them and don't think they can get out. Um, the city ever is doing a lot of great stuff. The Parks Department is uh, collecting and distributing firewood to people who are running out of firewood because they're home all day so they're heating their houses all day and so uh, the city arborist has been cutting up wood and coming to my house and uh, picking up firewood for people and so this really has uh, it's it's the beginning of a disaster but it really has uh, brought out the best in a lot of people yeah Lauren um, just a couple things um, I did want to mention, uh, I've seen that if people don't have health insurance right now, you can sign up right now. There's a window um, through now, through April 17th, where you can sign up at Vermont Health Connect. Um, so urge people who might need health insurance just to know that that is open and available to you. Um, and if you have a change in job situation, that is normally open anyway, but it's open to everyone right now. So hopefully, you know, as many people as possible can get um, the health coverage they need. Um, I also just wanted to echo, like, thank you to everyone for staying home, for following the advice we're getting from our medical professionals and public health experts. Um, and, you know, Chief Baker brought it up earlier that we're seeing great compliance. And so thank you for following it so we can do our best to keep as many in our community as healthy as possible. Um, and just like so many others, just I'm so appreciative of all the volunteer efforts and ways that people are stepping up to help each other and make sure that we're taking care of all of our community members in so many ways. And the city website has a bunch of links of mutual aid networks where you can both sign up to volunteer if you're able to or flag if you have needs um, and that um, somebody could help you with. And, um, you know, and even some of the fun things the city's doing is like, a scavenger hunt to bring out for your kids. Maybe that, I don't know if that's still cool to do, but um, you know, just different ways we're trying to take care of each other while we're all in this situation. So, so appreciative of um, the volunteers and the, the city staff that have been working so hard to respond to this emergency and figure out how to do their important work in different and new ways and really challenging times. So, really appreciative. <clears throat> so, uh, I also just want to. Uh, add to that, so I was able to be on the call with the Capital Area Neighborhood uh, leaders today. Um, it was good to just connect uh, with everybody to see everyone's face and and know who some of our leaders are uh, and know that uh, more resources are going to be available to them to get to their neighborhoods um, uh, more specifically uh, in the near future. And 
uh, also just so grateful for uh, for th all of them and all the other volunteers in the city who have uh, really stepped up to um, you know, be willing to help out in whatever way they can. Um, also, just again, also thankful for city staff uh, for navigating all the challenges um, with these times. And also just a reminder to folks to, uh, to as, as they need to, you know, uh, stay active, uh, stay grounded, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, certainly reach out if there is anything uh, that they need. Um, there's a, a lot of networks who are ready to, uh, to help folks. Um, so, you know, we're, we're here and, and ready in what ways and in the ways that we can. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it for me. Um, John, did you have anything? Oh, I should probably mention that uh, uh, we've added a little bit more restriction on the clerk's office. Uh, some things that were available by uh, appointment, such as marriage licenses, uh, um, notary services, and hands-on work in the vault, um, we're currently cutting off completely, uh, except under extraordinary circumstances, in which case someone can speak to me directly and we'll work something out. Um, you know, I also wanted to mention that, you know, we get a lot of calls and I'm starting to get calls from people who are scared to various degrees. And, you know, I'm not in a position to do much good, but I wanted to encourage people to keep calling and we'll do what we can, even if that just means listening. Yeah, thanks. Um, Bill. Um. Obviously, I'd like to thank all the work our city staff is doing. Um, they're scrambling to try to make this all work. I really appreciate it. I'd like to especially call out uh, Cameron and Seth from our staff and, and David from Orca for getting all this tech together and making it work. I think it went pretty well tonight. Sound is, we can hear you all perfectly in the room. And um, so they, they you're all up on the big screen. It's pretty cool. And. Uh, um, I think we're going to actually offer this option for our, our staff meeting tomorrow morning when we try to sort through some of these challenges. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been hard for people actually, and uh, but I, I really think for the most part our, our folks have kept the the people in need and the people in the community first and foremost, and I I really appreciate that. I agree. All right, uh, so I think that is uh, everything. So thank you all for um, making this work online this evening, and um, we'll see you again. We have another meeting. Right, right now your next meeting isn't scheduled for two weeks, uh, April 8th. April 8th? Yes. Yep. Okay. Uh, obviously, if we have need an emergency for any reason, we'll let you know. Now that we know how easy it is okay. to do this. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, thanks, thanks. everyone. And I'm going to call this meeting adjourned.